Hi, I'm Anna Marie Cox, and welcome to With Friends Like These, a podcast about difficult conversations and relationships and politics and politics and relationships and the way those things influence each other. It's a particularly special episode today. Uh, first of all, there's some stunt casting involved, a special crossover episode, uh, like, you know, when Buffy would be on Angel or Angel would be on Buffy. Um, I am doing this show today with my friend John Mo, who's the host of the Hilarious World of Depression podcast, which explores the world of depression through the lens of comedy. It's actually really great. And if you have an interest in either comedy or mental health issues, you should check it out. Um, and the other thing that's uh, particularly special about this episode of With Friends Like These is that, um, well, we couldn't decide if we had two hosts or two guests, or maybe we had two hosts and two guests. Uh, but basically we interview each other and we talk about uh, depression. We actually talk about suicide too. And if that's something that upsets you particularly, you might want to skip this episode. Uh, if you feel like you can hang in there, please do. Um, it's not just a special episode in some ways, uh, it's a pretty important episode. Thanks for listening. I guess we should introduce ourselves. Should we introduce each other here? Um, let's introduce ourselves because I, I feel like um, I always feel awkward introducing other people. Yeah, it so. feels a little like the Tonight Show. Yeah. I'm John Moe. I'm the host of the Hilarious World of Depression. And I am Anna Marie Cox, and I am the host of With Friends Like These. It is a, a two host, no guest, or two host. Double guest? I think it's two host double guest. Two host. I like to think. I like to think in forms of multipliers. Hosts and guests squared. It's hosting guests squared. Now, for for listeners of my show, can you fill us in a little bit on on what your show is all about? Sure. Uh, it is ostensibly sort of about politics. Um, it's with the Crooked Media Network, which is the Pod Save America, Pod Save the World, Pod Save Us All. I'm the I think the only non pod, <laughs> really non pod titled. Pod uh, bless the queen. Pod bless the queen. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's about, I, the long version, it's about relationships and politics and politics and relationships, uh, how our politics have an impact on our relationships and the other way around. And it's also about having conversations that you maybe have avoided or you didn't realize you had to have. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, I've had conversations with people uh, and the disability rights community uh, about just being disabled, like yep. which is something that a lot of able people don't kind of realize. They think you're not supposed to point it out, <laughs> right. you know, right. like you're not supposed to actually talk about the disa disabled people. If you don't talk about their disability, maybe they'll forget that they have exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really more like maybe I get to forget that they have it. Right. 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 Um, I talked with my good friend Ira Madison the third about being my black friend. Um, and being kind of the black friend in a lot of relationships, yes. like what that's like. I love that episode. Yeah, it's it's he's hilarious. Um, and we talk about politics too. I have a sort of reoccurring uh, guest, Rick Wilson, who's a you know diehard, never Trumper. But uh, for the most part, the guys at Pod Save America don't like it when I say it's a show about uh, awkward conversations because they think people don't want to listen in on awkward mm, conversations. Right, but it. It's a show about awkward conversations. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's, a, it's a show about de-awkwardizing a lot of those conversations. Yeah, and, and being aware of them, uh, being aware of what the awkwardness is, um, and, and going ahead and kind of diving through it. Because one of the things that we talked about, you know, when I talked to Ira, was uh, discomfort as a tool of oppression. Mm. Meaning, you know, I think a lot of white, able, cis, people who are not, you know, any part of very many vulnerable groups really hate being made aware of other people's discomfort and hate being uncomfortable themselves. Right. Would prefer to live life in comfort. <laughs> yeah. Comfort's awesome. Comfort. Their, their comfort zone. Uh, and so in a way, like your comfort, if you maintain, if you stay in a comfort zone, like you, it, that's a tool of oppression. Mm. It, and you need to, in order, if you want to be down with the woke folk. <laughs> you got to get a little uncomfortable. Got to get a little uncomfortable. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, my show, The Hilarious World yes, of Depression. Yes, please, for, I, I, and for my listeners, please. Yes, yes. Uh, produced by American Public Media here in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, is a discussion about clinical depression, or Clinny D, as we sometimes name <laughs> it on the show, uh, told through the lens of comedy and comedians. It's a, a topic that I think needs to be talked about a lot more, given how pervasive it is and how silent it often is. And so I got in touch with a bunch of my friends from the comedy world uh, who deal with clinical depression, and we talk about it. We talk about what's funny about it, what's human about it. And the idea is that you're more likely to want to hear about it from Maria Bamford than from uh, a medical expert. And so it's it's a little bit of sugarcoating to to let the pill go down. There is a remarkable overlap, of course, in those communities. Yes. Yeah. In the comedy and depression communities. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's kind of what I'm started wondering, are the there thing. comedians that don't get depressed? There's a few. I, okay. I found a few who I tried to book. You should try. I was going to say you should interview them. Yeah. No, I tried to book them and they're like, oh, I'd love to be on your show. I'm not actually depressed. What's that like, though? Know, right. <laughs> <laughs> but there's been big disagreement, too, about whether the... Uh, whether that job attracts depressed people or turns them into depressed people. And uh, some people say, well, no, it's just there's as many depressed people in comedy as there are in among postmen. But your postman doesn't go on stage and talk about suicidal ideation. Uh, your, your dentist <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't come up in their line of work. Right. Like when they give you the mail, they're not like, oh, by the way. By the way, I <laughs> thought about killing myself this morning. Yeah, your, your dentist isn't talking about despair. And if so, you wouldn't go to that dentist. Right. Um, but then a lot of people say, too, that it's, uh, it's sort of this perspective on life that you might gain through depression where, mm-hmm. you, where you can, you know, you've looked at the void before. And a lot of people have looked at it, even if they aren't willing to say it. So if you make a joke about the void and the meaninglessness and the despair, that's going to get a laugh because people recognize that from the secret parts of their own brain that they haven't wanted to recognize, right. so I, to speak. Yeah, you know, there's the same kind of debate about uh, alcoholics yeah. and addicts and creative professions. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I mean, part of me... I wants to think that the statistics are statistics and we're not that special, uh-huh. you know? Right. Um, and there are, you know, probably your postman. <laughs> now I'm thinking about this poor, drug-addicted, yeah. depressed postman <laughs> out there. The poor guy. You deserve help. Yeah. You know? uh, but alcoholics and addicts are some of the funniest people I've ever met, some of the smartest people I've ever met. You go to a 12-step meeting and you will laugh, I promise you. Yeah. In fact, like, I've told my stories um, – you know, about my recovery in non 12 step context, whether for, you know, um, uh, trying to be of service in other ways, like letting, you know, I think of them either civilians or earthlings. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're called normies. <laughs> um, we know what my, what my story has been like. And I have some lines in my story that I think are hilarious and this they do not go over well. They don't play. They do not play with the people who haven't been through it. They think there are jo- jokes about my depression, jokes about my bottom out, you know. Do you have any that you, you remember offhand or are they all contextual? Oh, they're all super contextual. Okay. <laughs> you know, except, I mean, except just, just describing like my time in the psych ward, which I've, I've spoken to you about before. Yeah, like, yeah. I want to get to that. And and sort of the genesis of our, our conversation here is, is we We've known each other for a while, and we got to talking about our shows, and we realized that on the Venn diagram, there's a, a big, <laughs> big overlap. Well, but in our specific interest, and Venn diagram with us, like, yeah. and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, my show is about awkward conversations, about talking about the stuff you don't talk about, and I know there's something that you don't talk about. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. Um, so. I have talked briefly on my show about my own depression, and this is something I've been dealing with since junior high school, at least, and only diagnosed until, not diagnosed until I was, I think, around 30, uh, maybe even a little bit past 30. And so I've been on a mission in that sense, but the event that has sort of driven my, my fervor along these lines was the death of my brother by suicide. Uh, My brother Rick died uh, in April of 2007, and he had been uh, a drug addict for many years. I mean, I guess once a drug addict, always a drug addict. That's the language, right? Well, uh, inactive. Yes, yes. He was an inactive drug addict, um, <laughs> as far as we know. 
Uh, for several years leading up to his death, he volunteered on a sobriety hotline, and he was uh, he was evidently clean. And I, I keep putting those qualifiers in there of as far as we know, and as evidently because his form of addiction, he when he was using, he was full of lies. Mm-hmm. He was just an incredibly charismatic guy. Everybody who came into contact with him wanted to be around him some more. Um, and he was able to use that to get all the, the drugs and money and shelter and <laughs> services that, that he needed. Um, he was very, very good at it. And so he went through uh, some sort of university clinical trial treatment thing, we are told, again with the qualifiers and seemed to sober up but uh he um i mean he'd used some hard stuff he'd used a lot of methamphetamine and uh when at the point he died he had been depressed for some time according to people who knew him he lived in san diego i lived in seattle when it happened and he had he had confided in them a little bit about what was going on he had gotten his ex-girlfriend pregnant and he was at the age of I think 45 about to be a father for the first time and was really terrified of that he told me um, several months before he died he told me Christmas the the Christmas before and it was really remarkable because I thought he's telling me about being terrified of being a parent and everybody I know who's had kids has been terrified of being a parent you'd be crazy not to be but there wasn't the uh, the excitement that goes along with it. Mm-hmm. The sort of I've you know I'm going to have a new best friend. <laughs> you know I have reproduced. Yes, yes, I, I've fulfilled my biological yeah. imperative and and I've reproduced. Um, but I didn't think much of it, and I didn't even know he was depressed. And from what I have gathered, which isn't much from his life down there, he received a a recommendation from a doctor that he get to inpatient treatment that he that this is very serious what he's facing and he didn't want to do that and he was ashamed of that he was ashamed of his mental illness and he was terrified that that he had reproduced and uh, he went to a gun range in San Diego um, signed up for a membership a couple weeks before had never been there as a member uh, showed up, uh, bought bought one box of bullets that uh, he never opened. He went so he went into the gun range, bought a box of bullets, went out to the range, and shot himself with a bullet that he had been carrying around in his pocket. Um, and uh, when I got the call that he had shot himself my wife called me and I said I I just remember the most calm I think I'd ever been I just said oh is he dead and she said I don't think so but you need to get down there you need to go to the airport right now and and get to to San Diego and I found out that it was at a gun range my first book had come out a few months before that in, in October of 2006 and uh, one of the chapters in it, I go to a gun range and I talk about how uh, I had to go there with a friend because the gun range wouldn't allow someone who wasn't a member to go there by themselves. And my brother had read my book. And so he had joined this gun range and then, and then killed himself there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a burden of responsibility I've been carrying around for a while, over 10 years now. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I got the call to, to, you know, that, that he, this had happened. I flew down there with, with my mom and my sister, and uh, we got there uh, to the emergency room just before he died. And then he died once we were there. So at the, at the, the service, we had a service down there and a service up in Seattle. And I thought, well, this sucks. Um, and it sucks that I didn't know that this was happening. It sucks that he felt a need to do this. Um, 
and it was it was the illness that did you know I, I told my, my son was in kindergarten at the time I said well your uncle had had a brain disease that we didn't know about and it killed him because I wanted to protect my five-year-old but I also wanted to tell the truth that's that is the truth it is the truth, the truth. and um and I thought there, there's got to be people need to talk about this more and, and, and I've been trying to talk about it in any venue I could find ever since. And, and this has been probably the, the loudest I've been able to talk about it is this podcast. Right. And so as someone who's a, um, in my, my, my part of this conversation is that I'm a survivor yeah. of a suicide attempt, actually a couple. Yeah. Which I, I'm not, I don't keep a secret, but I don't really talk about in this public venue. So, hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey. Tell, hey. Me about, tell me about the tattoo on your arm. Yes, that is one of the ways that I've decided to be public about it. Yeah. Uh, I have. I think it's a very poetic way. Well, so um, I started getting tattoos after I got sober. Uh, and they all have kind of stories about them. And one of the second one I got was actually a pen. It's a fountain pen. It's on my forearm. Uh, it, it hap- it's sort of in honor of my father, who collects fountain pens. Also, mm. I'm, hey, you know, I'm a writer. It's a little literal. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but last year... And writers are always losing their pens. I know. You've got this one is like right the there. only fountain pen I've never lost. There you go. Um, uh, the, but then last year, I added a little something. I added a, a semicolon at the end of the pen, as though the pen had written it. And the semicolon is a... You know, unofficial um, symbol of survivorship. Uh, survivorship of, I think some people use it as general mental illness, but mm-hmm. it's it started pretty specifically as a... People who have uh, attempted. People who have attempted suicide. And what it means is that you kept going. Like, you could have stopped, but you kept going. Right. As I, Writers usually especially appreciate the sentiment there. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and I did. I, and, and so I have it on my arm when people ask about it. You know, I, I do tell them. Uh, I, I'm really open about being in recovery from my other disease, right? Mm-hmm. My, my addiction. It is tougher. I've become more open about being bipolar. So this is like the, <laughs> this is the reveal on top of reveal. Yeah. Although it's funny, like if you look at the Venn diagram for people who have... Um, bipolar disorder people who are addicts alcoholics and people who have tried to commit suicide like you're gonna that's statistically I would you you could have guessed right it would have been a pretty safe guess uh, people who have that some, you were bipolar no, that I would attempt suicide uh, I would have attempted attempt suicide, suicide. Yeah. just because it's I read one statistic that it's something like 45% of those with substance abuse disorder have attempted wow. suicide at one point or another I know the statistic a little more firmly that six Times people with substance abuse disorders are six times more likely uh, to attempt suicide. People with co-occurring disorder, meaning substance abuse and some other mental illness, um, have like a thirty percent suicide, like thirty percent more likely to have suicidal ideations. It's it those three things. Like I hit the jackpot, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and I always, you know, I was listening to your story, which of course is heartbreaking. Um, but we you know one of the reasons I want to be out uh, is to be of service, not to just people who I think should be talking about their own. Um, again, we have to talk about our language. Struggles, challenges, struggle, challenges. Yeah, uh, I, I try to avoid the word fight because depressives, you know, would rather sit around in their sweats than than fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, we have to come up with better language. But yeah. I, you know, I want, I, I definitely want to be out about it because I think that. Stigma does prevent people from seeking help. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also I want to be out because I feel like I have a message for survivors, uh, the families, or uh, those who commit, the people whose families have gone through this, uh, an, a successful suicide attempt uh, in the family, which is that, and I know you must have heard this, but there's nothing you could have done. Yeah. Yeah. There really isn't. I. It's, that's, Yes. <laughs> I hope that helps to hear it from me. No, it does. It does. I mean, it it does help to hear it a thousand times. Um, and 
I can convince myself of that plenty of times, but it's, you know, it, uh, these things are, are complicated and, right. they, and they recur. Because in the end, it is sort of like an addiction in, in the sense that it's ultimately, it is an illness, yes, mm-hmm. but it ultimately resides within the person. Yes. And, and much as with, an, I, I'm sure a lot of people who have friends and loved ones who are in the group of addiction know that there's if that person wants to use there is nothing that's going to stand in their way right. nothing because they're not driving the ship at that point right and I, I feel like suicide is similar mm-hmm. but it's different in the sense that you can put up better roadblocks for people um, you can institute waiting periods for guns right. you know you can make it harder and I think every time you make it a little bit harder I mean that does some good well, that's the idea behind the guardrails on the bridges. Yeah. Just make it harder, get through that moment. Mm-hmm. Because it's true also, I read somewhere that most suicide ideations like last less than a minute. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you can get through that minute, you know, you, you're, you, you have a chance of getting better. Right. I mean, which is sort of the language of addiction, too. Yeah. You know, today I'm not going to drink. Right. And I, I want to hear, uh, if you'd like to share it, if you're willing to share it, kind of what led up to to your attempts and and what was going on you know in your brain like let's get to that relatable moment and I, and I know for for your show we need to to drop in a break right we'll drop in a break right here all right this break time you're listening to with friends like these with Anna Marie Cox are you hiring do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality Ooh. candidates If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. And I'm probably a bad person, but you know what? I'm sort of hoping that there's some uh, former Republican congressman that might be, you know, uh, on ZipRecruiter in a year, year and a half. Find out why ZipRecruiter has been used by Fortune 100 companies and thousands of small and medium-sized businesses. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash friends. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash friends. One more time to try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash friends. Uh, you know, give a former Republican congressman a job. They uh, might not do as much damage for you as they've done to us. Now we're back. Now the we're magic back. of radio. We're actually just like, we never went away, but... No, we were just sitting here. Yeah. Um... So we were talking about your your semicolon and your uh, your bipolar and your addiction and the circumstances that led up to your attempt to deal with it in the wrong way. Yes, the permanent solution to a temporary problem, yes. as people always, often say. So for me, it really is tied up with my mental illness and my addiction. I, I, I think I would have defied odds had I not attempted suicide. Um, but... You know, I was in the depths of both. I was an untreated manic depressive. Um, I'm, I'm bipolar two, uh, which tends to have lower highs and lower lows. That's the Catherine like, Zeta Jones Demi Lovato bipolar. <laughs> well, a sexy bipolar, isn't <laughs> yes. it? Yes. Uh, and in the highs are not as manic as a, sort of what you think of the uh, Homeland bipolar, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Claire Danes bipolar. Um, not the actress herself, but uh, the character. character. Um, it, but the lows are you are just you know uh, frozen and immobilized, and you know in that darkest, darkest depth. And of course, I was um, using depressants, which uh, just make it worse. Yeah. Alcohol and also um, benzos, uh, both of which are and, and and also I was you know courting death just t- by mixing those two things. What that, are benzos? Benzodiazepines. Um, Xanax is the gotcha. most popular okay. one. That's what I was doing. Um, I had a prescription, you know, like I, when that I went... That means it's healthy. It was, yeah, it's good for you. Um, and my, you know, my marriage was in trouble. Um, 
and I felt – and my consequences, as, as we say, were adding up. My legal consequences, my work consequences. Um, you know, I'd been arrested for uh, DUI. Um, you know, my, my work was really, you know, starting to suffer. Um, and being coming kind of erratic – more than just typical freelance writer erratic, mm-hmm. <laughs> like really erratic in my work. It's good with a, a writer and journalist to know that you can count on them. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of the whole thing. <laughs> exactly. Although we're also notoriously erratic, but right. there's like, but like you, I was outside the boundaries. Like editors had no idea what they were going to get. You uh-huh. know? Um, so my overall feeling in that period was just of guilt. Um, crushing guilt. That you would let somebody down, let yourself down? Everyone down, and that I was a burden, and that I was never going to get better, and that I... And this profound loneliness, too. Because um, nobody understood what you were going through. But then I felt, I felt stupid for thinking that. You know, I'm smart enough to know that, like, other people go through this. I've read the books, you know. I, I mean, I, I, knew what, I knew what my diagnosis was, right? Sure. Um, but I just, yeah, I would say loneliness and guilt were the, the things that weighed down on me. And actually like even telling you this right now, I can feel, I can feel it the way that I felt it then, which is like this feeling in your chest of weight, like a, like a metal band around my chest. Mm. And, And you know, it's there, but that doesn't make it any more comfortable. Right. And, and, you know. Drinking and using helped. I mean, I, I mean, relieve the symptoms. Relieve the symptoms. And you know, I just basically came to a point uh, where I thought the only solution was to just not exist. That I was never going to get better. I was never going to be anything but a burden. I was never going to escape this crushing guilt. And. Everyone would be better off, including myself, if I ceased to exist. Did you think that that would that there would be relief for you that followed that? Because this is sort of the conundrum of suicide, right? Is right. That you, there is no you to feel better, as Dick Cavett said. Yeah. And this is where maybe sort of the fog of using comes in because it, it wasn't it, – most addicts and alcoholics aren't thinking about consequences in general. So I think that in a weird way, like, I was, I was, I was being just as short-sighted with my thoughts of suicide as I was with, you know, drunk driving. Like, I wasn't thinking about, about what would happen next. Right. If you I had d- been, you wouldn't be doing those things in the first exactly. place. Exactly. Yeah. I was just thinking it, – it's sort of um, – I often compare it to, like, it's just like being in extreme pain of any kind. Like, you just want relief from your pain. Mm-hmm. And you don't think about what's going to happen after you get that relief. Like, the feeling of pain is so overwhelming. It's so present. You can't think straight. Right. You know? And so you don't make good decisions. <laughs> You're not making good decisions. And so, you know, that I, yeah, I, I, took, I, I, I took what I had. Um, I had just gotten a fresh prescription. Um, and then I was just really lucky. Um, uh, I made it. I made it. Um, and I, I woke up in the ER. <laughs> wait, wait, describe the circumstances. I'm so glad you made it. Describe the circumstances that you were in. Like, where were you? What what was going on when you uh, when you took them? And what did you take? Well, I don't want to get into too much detail. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's let's not get into what you took because we don't I, want to give people any details. And I don't want to get. Oh. Um. Let's see. So I was actually on a business trip, which is sort of embarrassing, too. But, like, that's my, you know. Travel's a total trigger, though. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, um, it's for a lot of people, both depressives and for um, people with substance abuse orders, because you're away. So mm-hmm. there's kind of this feeling of, like, oh, I can get away with it, or it's a special occasion or whatever. So um, I was, it was at the end of a day that I had, you know, I'd sort of been good quote unquote good um, but then had relapsed and uh, was being called on it and I, I, I just made this decision of 
you know, not thinking about what it would do to the people in my life, not thinking about my husband at the time, not thinking about my family, my mother, my father. That's another thing that's really short-sighted. It's, it's incredibly self. I mean, I feel like I can say this. It's an incredibly selfish thing to do. Like yeah. committing suicide is really fucking selfish. Right. But the disease, the, the addiction, or the or the depression, or whatever it is, is blinding you to that. Right. Um, so I wasn't thinking about anyone or anything else. I was just thinking about my pain. And uh, so I took, um, this, I had this brand new Xanax prescription. I was already pretty loaded um, on booze. And I just, you know, I just swallowed everything. Uh, and I was lucky, you know, um, my ex-husband found me before things got too bad. And... Uh, I mean, I don't remember any of anything, really, except waking up. You didn't expect to wake up. I didn't expect to wake up. I was so pissed. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't like, oh, another chance at life? No. Well, I pissed. I was kind of like, I felt defeated. Defeated is probably the better word. I felt like, I think my like exact sort of thought was, oh, fuck. Like, fine. You know, I guess... All right, fine. Another obstacle. You know, yeah. well, no, it was, it was the sense of surrender, which is a good thing. Yeah. You know. Higher uh, power. Higher power. I did have a moment of, like, I wasn't thinking in terms of higher power. Like, I'd been to A or whatever, but, like, I wasn't really thinking about recovery. But I just remember thinking, okay, fine. Like, you win this round. You know. <laughs> I'll give it another shot. Meaning I'll give, you know, life another yeah. shot. Because yeah. I had this, I did have this really... Um, overwhelming feeling of well that that there must be some other plan for me mm. were you religious before? I was not religious and it's hard to talk about it because it was just this real sense and I don't mean to, I don't want to make it like mystical or anything but it no. was more like again like I, I, I wasn't even thinking in terms of a god or a higher power but I was thinking alright fine I was surrendering to something when I said alright fine Mm-hmm. Like, I'll give it a shot. Mm-hmm. It was some sense of like, okay, well, that didn't work. And I am out of ideas. Mm-hmm. I am just done. Because that was the last, that was my, that played my last card. Yeah. And it didn't work. So I guess I'm just, you know, to sit, use the, you know, cards metaphor. I'm just, sit, I'm just sitting there. I'm just like going to, whatever cards come my way. Yeah. Like. What's the Dorothy Parker line? Like, poison tastes awful, might as well live. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it was, yeah, it was sort of a might as well live situation. And I was in this place of just complete befuddlement and surrender. And so I started to basically do most of what people suggested. What the very first thing was, which was, was unavoidable, was not a suggestion. <laughs> it was a very, very firm uh, requirement by the state that I go to a psych ward for a while. Ah, involuntary commitment. Involuntary commitment. Yay. Now, from what I've heard, and I've, I've talked to a few people on my show who've gone through this, uh, <laughs> Maria Bamford, actually Maria Bamford has, talks about this on a brand new Netflix special, that if you're looking to go somewhere to get healed, no. <laughs> you're just going into basically a tank where they take away your phone and you have to watch really bad TV yeah. with people who might even be worse off than you. Right. Oh, this was a definitely worse off than me situation. Um, I had been in, uh, committed before, um, voluntarily committed uh, to a psych ward where it was very posh. It was like a private hospital mm. and like you got to keep your own clothes and order off a menu and mm-hmm. have your phone. And <laughs> it was it was a little just like kind of a spa. Like it uh-huh. was, it, I mean, you know, like a kind of a downscale spa, maybe. Uh-huh. Right. Um, this... The this, public university of, it, of spots. <laughs> right. this, this was a public hospital that I went to. And I say this with love and respect, but it had, like, you know, actual crazy people. Like, people who were manifesting their symptoms, not just rich people who were trying to deal. Like, yeah. this was were people, you know, schizophrenics. Psychotics. Like psychotics. Yeah. And um, thank God for them, man. Like, I... Because I belong there. It was this breakthrough for me. It was like fine. It was like being like, you know what? I can't fool myself any longer. Like the I'm crazy too. When I say like they're real, real crazy people. This word, like, well, I'm I was one of them. Like yeah. I went crazy. That's why you were there. I was there because I was crazy. I was there because I could not be trusted. You know, they took we took away all the sharp objects and the you know shoelaces and belts, and we had to eat with everything with spoons. 
<laughs> and had you, been, I mean, that must have been. It only color with crayons. We actually, the adult coloring book craze, like, that happened, I laughed so hard when it sort of started because they had coloring books when I was in the psych ward. Yeah. And uh, we could, we had to color with crayons because we weren't wow. trusted with other. <laughs> yeah, you're back in kindergarten. <laughs> and um, I remember complimenting uh, the aide that had them, like, he sort of ran the coloring book. <laughs> hour <laughs> your dealer your hookup with the crayons yeah with the crayons because they were like fairly like non you know there w- wasn't a lot of frozen we were actually there were like you know mandelas and like unicorns and stuff and uh, he was talking about how hard it was to find non children yeah you don't oriented want door of the explorer color, yeah coloring point. books and I'm like he and I was when the adult coloring book craze happened I was like wow his life is useful <laughs> thank god for that <laughs> He's finally caught he's a got, break. He's got a break. He doesn't have to like go searching through deviant art forums right. <laughs> to print something up on his little right. HP right. printer. He can, he can buy whole books. Like, I mean, good for him. Like, his life is easier now. Was there a, a, a marker that you had to hit in order to get out of there, or one that you were aware of? It was of? a like, time period. It was just a time period. Oh, okay. Um, you had to do time. I had to do time, but it was. Joined. It was. I'm so glad it, it happened. Uh, not only did there was an a, someone brought an AA meeting to that uh, psych ward, and I don't remember anything about the meeting except just thinking the two people that brought it had you know, part of their story. They said that they'd been in psych wards themselves, and they seemed to be having decent lives. Mm-hmm. And I had that grasping thought that a lot of people have, which is that okay, all right, they did it, so it's possible. All right, maybe me. You know, okay. All right. It's, Had you like, owned up I, to being an addict at that point? I knew. Um, yeah. But you had you said it out loud? I'd said it. I'd been to meetings, but um, you know, like the you hear a lot from people in substance resources, like terminal uniqueness, and by that <laughs> they mean terminal as in a disease. Mm. Like it's it's a it's a deadly form of uniqueness. And that's what people, you know, often have. And I felt like I had that. I, I definitely had thought I was like, well, it wouldn't work for me. Like, that it works for you guys, but not me. And But, you know, having this kind of bottom made me, and seeing other people who had been through it made me think, all right, this is, it could work for me. Yeah. And the other thing that happened at that meeting was everyone had to go to everything because there weren't enough people to... <laughs> you know have separate groups so right. like you had the actual crazy people at the at the AA meeting too and I don't want to I now feel like I can't I shouldn't talk too much about it but let's just say like there are some really interesting shares because some colorful because stories some colorful stories that may or may not be rooted in reality, reality. as we know it. yeah yeah and uh there are two other gentlemen there that were lucid <laughs> <laughs> who identified as alcoholics I remember like bonding with them and they were both uh, there as guests of the state, mm-hmm. um, both black guys. And actually, I remember having a moment with them where they asked me what I was going to be doing after I got out. And I was like, oh, well, they want me to go to treatment. Um, and they both were like, oh, man, that's awesome. And I was like, <laughs> you got a ticket. I was like, oh, right. Like, that is awesome. I do get to go to treatment, you know. Because you're a. Uh... A white lady because I'm a white lady with insurance and you know resources yeah. and yeah. they they were t- yeah like they you know one guy was going to sign up for um, sign up for a study a research study in order to get treatment and the other guy just didn't know what was going to happen wow. um, and then the other really amazing thing that happened while I was there was there was this woman um, who I think was probably schizophrenic Mm-hmm. She had a very loose relationship, which went to the reality when we would be in group to talk. Like, her, her shares were off, you know, would kind of go off into very, uh, fant- into fantasy. Mm-hmm. And she was, a couple of things, I remember she was actually really beautiful. Um, she was sort of older, um... She looked like the lead singer of, I think said so this, like uh, Kim Gordon. She looked like Kim Sonic Gordon. Sonic Youth. Sonic Youth, yeah. yeah. And she was trying to share at a group session once, and I, she was so frustrated. I remember she got this look on her face. Like, you're, like when you're trying to remember a word, like, 
or something, but what she said was, I can't make my words match my mind. Wow. Those are some words to live by. And I... I just was like, same, <laughs> you know. That's sort of the whole. Same. That's sort of the whole thing. Like, if you break your leg, there's all sorts of terminology for exactly what the problem is. If there's a vertebra problem, you you can identify which vertebra. You can't do that with mental illness. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about I think about that woman a lot. Actually, I know. I hope she's can't make your words match your brain. Yeah, match your mind. Mind. Mind, brain. Mind, it was, brain but it was this is the idea that, like, again, it's just what I what I want to tell you is inexpressible. Yeah. What I'm trying to tell you is uh, is impossible to express. Must have been heavy for you as a writer too, because your whole job is to express those things with words. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I can try. I mean, I think we're doing an okay job talking about it right now. But, yeah. um, you know, I think that anyone who's been through it, any kind of mental illness, um, understands that. There is it's ultimately very lonely yeah. feeling. That's one of the reasons why it feels so lonely is because you don't. It's the feelings do not translate very well at all, even for writer the, the most best writers in the world. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I I've been dealing with this like I said for a very long time, and and I've reached several sort of resigned points where I'm like, well, screw it. I'm this isn't going to get cured. Um, this is going to be good at sometimes and bad at other times, but I'm just weird. Like that, that's always the term that's, that's been in my head. It's like, I know I'm not, I'm not processing things like I think other people are. I'm not responding to situations like other people do. Sometimes I am, but often not. And screw it. I'm just weird. I'm just going to be weird forever. And it, and it took you know, someone diagnosing me is no, this is, you have a chemical thing. You have a, a disease called depression. Here are ways we can mm. treat it. That has uh, led me to start thinking of it in, in other terms or attempt to, I don't always succeed. I still think I'm awfully weird. I think weird's a good word. I also think diagnoses are incredibly freeing actually. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think some people see being diagnosed with a mental illness, whether it's addiction or depression or bipolar as a sentence of some kind, as a limiting thing. Right. Like I had the experience because it happened for me when I was in treatment of it being a very freeing sense because I was like, Oh, so that's what's wrong with me. Yeah. You are understood. Like it's sort of go to go back to like feeling like you can't express stuff. It's like being told like, Oh, that's a broken leg. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know, and we can. We'd have some things that we can do. Yeah, I've dealt with three broken legs this week in this office. Right. And here, here's my plan for your to help heal you. And it works sometimes. I mean, it's it's unlike other illnesses, yeah. physical illnesses, because it's a lot of guesswork still. Yeah. But both both being diagnosed as an addict and also being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which another word we talked about earlier, disorder is a weird word, but mm-hmm. um, being bipolar. You're a bipolar American. I'm a bipolar American. That's right. <laughs> um, it was like, woohoo, okay, well, that explains a lot. Yeah. That is Did you get the bipolar? Honestly, the, my first thought was, well, that, that does explain a lot. Right, that connects some things. <laughs> Did you get that diagnosis while you were in lockup? Uh, no, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, then I, more thorough you know, conversations and diagnoses um, once I was in treatment and stabilized. Because, mm. you know, part of the problem in the lockup was that I was still basically kind of coming out of, you know, I was you know, going through withdrawal. Like, I wasn't I wasn't well yeah. for a lot of reasons. Right. Um, so I sort of stabilized in treatment. I was in treatment for four months. Wow. Uh, highly recommended for, if you can afford it. Um, if the insurance gods grant you the power. If the insurance gods grant you the power. We can, you and I talked about we might, we might have to do a sidebar on insurance coverage yeah. Yeah. And, um, but I for people with co-occurring disorders often suggested they do long term uh, inpatient treatment and I was lucky enough to be able to do that which actually insurance did not cover the long term part I have my father to thank for being able to do, do it he was um, really amazingly you know he's my dad so of course he did it but on the other hand yeah you were very fortunate very fortunate um 
So, but it was the sense I really, really did have like, oh, that really does connect the dots on some things. Like I'm, I'm a very specific kind of weird. Yes. <laughs> like it's not just <laughs> amorphously weird. You're listening to With Friends Like These with Anna Marie Cox. Buying tickets to sports and concerts can be complicated, but there is a better, simpler way with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to live events. With SeatGeek's seamless mobile experience, you can buy and sell tickets in just two taps. SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, guaranteed. There is nothing quite like seeing your favorite team or musician in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it is by far the easiest way I've found to buy concert tickets. I actually... uh, I bought tickets to see Coldplay, which don't tell anyone because it's um, not my favorite band. It's my my husband's favorite. Well, I won't say it's his favorite band. That would embarrass him. But he um, he likes Coldplay. I, I, I put it down to our age difference, um, basically. But anyway, they're coming to town, and I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be able to find tickets, but I could. I did. I found tickets. I found tickets at lots of different prices. I had to do a little bit of calculation about how much do I want to see this band versus how much does my husband want to see this band um, and how much would he be willing to spend to see my favorite band, which is not his favorite band. Um, anyway, I'll let you know how that turns out. Um, but we got the tickets and it was super, super, super easy. Uh, it is designed to make your ticket buying experience easy. So, it does that. Uh, it saves you time and money by searching for multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. To get the most bang for your buck, SeatGeek grades every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. Best of all, my listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code FRIENDS today. That's promo code FRIENDS for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Do it for someone you love. There's some stuff that I did that I couldn't explain to myself, like behaviors, mainly having to do with like kind of the more mania stuff, like when I would like take everything out of my closet and stay up for two days, like organizing it or... Like I would like develop these grand plans for books and order a thousand things off Amazon and uh-huh. you know, then get depressed and just look at the boxes, you know. Uh, but you were you were an achiever too. Mm-hmm. Like this, I talked with with Peter Sagel from Wait Wait about this. Wait Wait Don't Tell Me, and, and he talked about uh, you know, he got into a great college and he wrote mm-hmm. plays that got pretty and like he was sort of on the run from his from his mental illness if he just kept achieving then see everything's fine clearly and you had a you've had a really interesting and varied and successful career yeah although of course in the inside it's always not successful enough never Mm. successful enough yes ever 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 enough because i i mean i i i've gone through something similar where where you once i got a national radio show I'm like, oh my God, now my problems will be solved. Oh wait, that's not going to fill the hole that's inside. Not going to fill the hole inside. And also, um, I think this is common for people with all the different things that we have, (laughs) which is that if I can do it, then it must be a dumb. Like if I can do it, it, it's not that hard and my achievements are worthless and... Or I'm a fraud who will soon be exposed. Or a fraud who, I mean, so everything I ever did that was like a big deal, I'd be like, oh, well, I guess it's not a big deal. I thought that would be a big deal, but it's not because I could do it. So that means any, any idiot could. So on to the next thing that I think is hard. And then if I achieve it, then, oh, well, I guess, yeah, that, that turned out to be like not really important either. Right. Um... So, I mean, I was like, you know, I also come from an alcoholic family and that's a very like adult child of alcoholic kind of thing too. Like trying to fill the, fill the hole with accomplishments and achievements. Look at me, look at me, look at me. (laughs) And also you don't have to worry about me. Right. I am good. Yes. I am good. You don't have to worry about you. you. I'm not a burden to you. Yeah. Which I think is, I, I, I imagine there was some of, for your brother, some of that. I think so. I mean, I think, and we have we have alcoholism in our family as well. And, you know, for me, like I, I took to, to theater at a very early age 
and I, I was telling somebody the other day, I've never been a good enough actor to make it big as an actor, but I've been a good enough actor to get through a lot of situations. <laughs> I'm just good enough for that. Um, you know, probably can't play Hamlet, but I can get out of a party once in a while. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think like my brother dealt with, uh, the, the chronic, uh, you know, dormant mental illness in our family and the, the substance abuse issues. And I'm sure he was predisposed to a lot of that. And from a very early age, uh, he started smoking pot and that led to a bunch of other things and most of which I don't know about, but I know there were DUIs and I know there was, uh, I know there was problem gambling in mm-hmm. his life. And uh, I think he, he was, I mean, to use the term a lot of people use, self-medicating. He was, he was trying to make that pain go away. Yeah, I, I think it, I mean, it works till it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Like that's another sort of right. saying, but it, it does work for a while. Like yeah. the achieving works for a while. Yeah. You know, but, and, but eventually the more things you try to use to fill that emptiness, the emptiness just gets bigger. Right. Like the emptiness stretches, you know, out the more you put in it, unless you address the emptiness itself. Or be, And I think, not to just abuse our metaphors, but I think what happens in recovery for either addiction or mental illness is you just, you do address the void. Mm-hmm. Like you're just like, you know what, that's there. Yeah. And it's something I'm going to have to work on, but I can't just stuff it with other things and right. pretend it doesn't exist. Right. I just have to be okay with like naming it, naming it and not being okay. Like I have to be okay with not being okay. Yeah. 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 In a weird way, that's how you start to get better. Well, it's the elephant in the room. Right. You're, you're saying, look, this is a thing that exists. And, and I'm, you know, we, we started our podcast about depression and I thought, oh, this will be kind of a, a fun little thing. I got to talk to some of my friends and, and you know. You actually probably did have that thought, didn't you? It'll be fun. It'll be fun. And, and you know, well, I mean, I, I did sort of look at what was on my, my mental, what was in my mental pantry that mm-hmm. I had available to work with. And I'm like, well, I know a lot of comedians and I'm depressed. <laughs> Let's see if we can make a pie out of that. <laughs> it's like the podcasts are like the omelet of media. Yeah, it's just throw it all yeah, in the Yeah, he's like, what do I have? Yeah, oh, I have some I'll just stir, stir that up, a little olive oil. Yeah. Um, and, and people have really responded to it, I think, because... And this, it astonishes me how much people respond to open conversation mm-hmm. about this. Because I'm kind of used to being a, a semi-public figure, and I know you are too. And it's like, oh yeah, I guess a lot of people don't talk about these things. Yeah, and I'm always, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we decided to to talk about this, uh, you know, for a podcast and put it out is because I do think it helps people because there isn't enough conversation about these issues, especially around suicide. Um, There are 41,000 suicides every year. And we're at like a 30 year high on them. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And drug and alcohol related suicides are up 50% in the last 10 years. Um, a third of all suicides, I think, have some kind of, you know, alcohol or drugs involved. Um, and they're pointing to uh, a widening economic disparity yeah. as a huge contributing factor right now, too. Yeah. And then you got so all the military. It's a great idea to take away some health care. That's what you want to do. <laughs> what you want to do at a moment like this is take away people's access to mental health care. Oh. But <laughs> while we still have it, <laughs> um, I think what if we, we start to try and address the prevention part of it the prevention part of it does mostly lie with the person who's suffering mm-hmm. you know and what I would like to what I would hope that people get out of my talking about it is to, is to go ahead and tell people tell a doctor tell a therapist tell a teacher yeah. tell, tell some, a spouse tell a spouse because one of the things that was I feel like I can laugh about now but um I thought everybody thought about suicide. I thought that that was I thought that was normal. I thought, <laughs> and I know it seems so ridiculous. You had, the, you had the ideation for, for a long time. For years, yeah. years, years and years. I, I hope my dad doesn't get upset listening to this. But um, you know, going back to like probably even earlier than junior high, not active, which is another reason why I thought it was sort of normal. 
Mm-hmm. Because I wasn't like taking steps. I wasn't making a plan. Mm-hmm. It was more like just this passing thought of like, oh, that's an option. Yeah. That is an option that, that I have. And I just assumed everyone else, like when they w- were going through the ways they had to deal with life, like that's always option E, you know, like you can do this A, B, C, D or E. Yeah. Kill yourself. Eh. All right. No, not this time. Yeah. Right. A lot of people never consider E. I, I always think it's like you're on a freeway and suicide is the off ramp. Mm-hmm. But nobody nobody else realizes. Everybody else thinks they're on like some kind of expressway <laughs> where there's no off ramp. <laughs> and you're like, don't you see what it just yeah. went by? Yeah, you could do that. And I so I was constantly making the choice to not not do it. Yeah. And because I was making the choice not to, I never thought about the fact that I had it in my mind at all. And I never talked about it to anyone. Um, one of the most helpful things I did in treatment was my counselor had me keep track of, of times I thought about self-harm. And it turns out it was like, a you know, it was multiple times a day. And she <laughs> she was like, and on it, that's not, it's not normal. It's not. It's okay. It's okay that it's not normal. Yeah. But it's not. And you deserve to have someone help you with this. Yeah. Which is a huge leap to make. To, the first leap is like to share it all, and then the second leap is like, oh, but you, I also get help for this. Yeah, yeah, really? right, right. It's it's not normal and it's addressable. Um, I remember, you know, very first time I was uh, clinically depressed, which I was diagnosed as a depressive before bipolar. It's, tip, I think, somewhat normal to get that, for people to miss the manic part of bipolar too. But yeah, and the, but with bipolar too, it's kind of an umbrella diagnosis where depression. Is part of yeah, it. yeah. Um, but I remember the very when I was first diagnosed with depression, I didn't want to take the antidepressants because I thought it was cheating. <laughs> it was like I don't deserve to take this antidepressants because then I'll just feel better. I won't have done the work. Man, ear infections make... never do this. Like <laughs> depression is so insidious. It's like it, it, it's destroying all your ability to fight it. You know. You never get this from strep throat. Yeah, I didn't strep deserve. Strep throat isn't a jerk like that. I don't. Strep throat never makes you think like, oh, you didn't earn that antibiotic. <laughs> right. You, have you to deserve just, an infection. You just have to suffer through this infection <laughs> until you get better by yourself. I totally. I mean, I. And that's the way I. I and although I did did take antidepressants, you know, I, I still kept drinking, which so it didn't really help. They weren't able to do their job, and I still carried with me that kind of attitude of like, I I need to be able to fix this myself. Like, I don't deserve help for this. Mm. Um, And I also really would like people to understand that uh, suicide ideation is is not normal and you get to talk to people about it. And also attempts, no matter how quote-unquote unserious they may seem, are fucking serious. Yeah. And you deserve help for them, too. And there's no... I think I felt, and I also, I somehow got the message that, like, my first attempt, since it wasn't really serious, like, was, I kind of felt bad. I felt like I was, oh, I was being, like, a drama queen. Well, and, and people use that term, oh, that's just a cry for help. That's just a cry. For, well, it's a cry for help. It's a cry for help. <laughs> it's like if someone's out there in the ocean drowning and they're crying for help. Yeah. You don't say, oh, well, just get over it. Yeah. You know, pull yourself The water's not that deep. Come on. Like, if someone's in the... So let's say, you know, it's it's the the, the swimming metaphor, right? Uh, If someone drowning... If in the water's only 10 feet deep, you're Mm -hmm. not like, water's only 10 feet deep. I can swim out of that. Why can't you? Like, yeah, you can't touch the ground. You still could drown, but it's all... I mean, it's not like you're in the ocean. It's not like you're really in the ocean. Like, call us... Call us when you're in the ocean. Right. Well, then we'll save you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember when I was uh, I worked at Amazon.com before I got into radio, and it was it was a very I mean I think they're all intense times at at Amazon. There was that New York Times article a while ago about you know they discovered all these people from Amazon cried at their desks. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, that's what you you get in in the morning. You check yeah. your meetings. You check your email. You cry. Then you, you know, yeah. you, you fire something up. It's like the two-minute hate. There's like the two-minute yeah, cry. Exactly. Yeah. And I was working on some project with a really crazy deadline. And I was, I remember driving into work like, wouldn't it be great if I just killed myself? Hmm. Oh, well, I guess I better get to work. And it just, and I think it was so sudden and so, such a strange thought. I'm like, 
okay, I can recognize that as an intrusive thought. Mm. <laughs> like, that is not a legitimate option that I can do. But how strange that the wiring in my brain, which I did not set up, uh, it goes to that place. Yeah. And, it, and there's just some of us it does. And yeah. it, is, it does take, and it takes some work to stop thinking like that. Yeah. But now I don't think like that, and it, every once in a while I have to, I have to be, I have to take a step back and be like, "Wow, like yeah. that's not on my radar anymore." That's gotta feel good. It, it doesn't feel like anything unless I recognize it, uh-huh. right? It just feels like, oh, this is what it is like to not think that way. You don't think about it until you think about it, right? Because um, it's the new normal. It's the new normal, but it does take constant work you know I continue to try and heal myself there's no there's no pill I do take lots of different pills all, all prescribed and none of them uh, you know all the, they're good the good kinds of pills um, they not mood altering that's what they say it's mm-hmm. the difference between you know Xanax and uh, well you try right but uh, it there is recovery work to be done in mental illness that is in, in parallel way to addiction where you know, I, I I still do daily affirmations, which still feel idiotic. Uh-huh. The very first time I ever was asked to look in the mirror and tell myself that I liked myself, felt like a fucking idiot. Yeah, and my I therapist just, has me mentally go to my happy place. And I'm like, oh, come on. Uh, but it kind of helps. It helps, <laughs> I know. Well, I remember telling my counselor in, in treatment, like, I feel so dumb. Like, I cannot do this. I cannot stand in front of a mirror and tell myself, like, awesome things about myself. And she was like, okay, what did you do when you were drunk? Were you, mm. like, could you, like, how does that, was, were you, wait, did you do some stuff that was stupid then? And I was yeah. like, okay, well, good point taken. <laughs> Touche. Touche. <laughs> and then she said, and I said, well, I also don't think it's going to work. I just don't believe this is going to work. Like, I'm too smart for it to work, right? Mm. I'm, I know the truth about myself, which is that I'm a horrible person. So I won't believe this bullshit from myself. Right. that I'm not. Right. And she said, well, you know, I understand you think that positive affirmations, positive self-talk won't work. How did the negative self-talk work? Did that, did that have an effect? How's that working out How's for that? you? Yeah. And I was like, again, touche. <laughs> Trained therapist. Trained therapist. You are earning your <laughs> keep. And because the negative self-talk, I think we can all recognize this. Negative self-talk totally works. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> That's why so many people love it. Yeah, it is effective. And so, you know, I do positive self-talk. Like, you know, I have a spiritual, like, practice. I try to do meditation. Like, a lot of people, like, you know, it's our in American way of life. It's hard to fit in. Yeah. Um, I have a therapist. You know, I see a I see a psychiatrist every three months right. to check in on meds. Uh, so it's not like it just goes away and I'm better. So I'm I never in a very good way. I think I never forget that I'm on this journey. Yeah. Of of getting better. Like there's always like it's all it's a, it's not going to end. It's you know? funny how the the ridiculous stuff works really well. I mean, I guess there's a, a reason why it became a cliche is because it became so present. I mean, I like I, I was talking about with my brother, I wrote this book where I talked about, you know, the circumstances with which some people kill themselves in, at a gun range, and then a few months later he did that exact thing. And uh, I was you know, I was like, well, I gave him the idea, the blood's on my hands, or when he was calling me over the years and I got the sense that he was just trying to hit me up for money I wouldn't return his calls and if I had he'd be alive and I've got you know I went through therapy and I I went through all these things in therapy talking about that and I would say well isn't it a little convenient to say that I'm not responsible (laughs) like doesn't that get me off the hook a little bit too easy. Isn't that a plot it's a device? Like, I don't deserve to get better. Yeah, and and uh, and I had a therapist who said, "Isn't it a little convenient to say that you are responsible?" Yeah. Um, but what it really took, because I couldn't, I could understand intellectually every drop of not being responsible. Like I, I got it, and I got the reasoning. I got the, you know, the research. Fine, but I couldn't in my heart do it. 
and I did um, EMDR. Have you ever yeah. heard of this? Yeah. Where you, and you have these little electrical buzzers it sounds in your hand. Suspiciously like Scientology. It I sounds think. like the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah. And but uh, but um, by these little like brain retraining things and concentrating on the very devastating um, but truthful sentence, Rick shot himself. Those three words. Um, you know, it's a devastating thing to hear about your hero, your big brother, who taught you how to drive. Um, but it it really has pushed me towards a truth that I can then work to maintain. But it came with hand buzzers. <laughs> like cans, right? Yeah. Like they're, yeah. Like, they're like sort of like the Scientology cans. Exactly. Yeah. I know. I, and, you know, I was waiting for the therapist to want me to sign up for $10,000 in extra <laughs> classes or send me off to Sea Org, yeah. but that didn't happen. And I would, I, I, it's been recommended to me. I haven't, um, I've been able to muddle forward without yeah. it. But yeah, apparently, especially highly traumatic events, it's been suggested to me to deal with, you know, some of the other traumas in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, does it our brains are so weird yeah like, they're just they're just goo and nobody really knows how they work like antidepressants no one's really sure like exactly how they work no yeah. one's really sure how addiction works yeah um, there's indication that depression might be related to swelling like oh. there might be some swelling in there yeah sure. I, why know, not it's so. all goo why shouldn't it swell <laughs> i i like the theory that um a lot of uh, mental disorders are sort of like ocd Mm-hmm. That there, that's why like Wellbutrin is used to treat a bunch of different stuff. The compulsiveness, because it's a, every a lot of it's compulsion, right? Yeah. And I do think of like my suicide ideation was a compulsion. Yeah. Like was something like it was a it, it turned into this thought that was just present. Right, just routes right back to that place. Yeah, and like I don't even want to say out loud like the negative self talk that I had, but I had a very distinct litany. just you know loop loop um i'm a bad person i want to die i'm a bad person i want to die i'm a bad person and it was like a tape loop i i tried to another thing like i can't make my words match my brain i would try to describe it to people and it because it feels like a tape loop somehow in your head like i have this image of like of of the reel to reel like running behind my eyes and um, it would be intrusive and would not go away and would occur to me at the weirdest times. And eventually it was, it was inescapable, you know. Was it comforting in a way? I do think so. Yeah. I do think that... Because there must be a reason you kept going back to it. I, I think in some ways that that is what compulsiveness yeah. teaches you. It's a catechism. Is, is it teaches you to be comfortable with those things? You develop an addiction mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. And when it goes away, like, you have to learn other ways to think. Yeah. And you have to learn a new reality to ground yourself in because that one is, is familiar but toxic. Yeah. And it's I, I've said to people a thousand times, like, for me, cutting out the drugs and alcohol was relatively easy. Like, I just, I happened to luck out kind of just physiologically. Uh-huh. I didn't have a terrible time. Um, I wasn't addicted to opiates, number one. Those are physically right. pretty tough to kick, just the physiology of it. Yeah. Um, alcohol can be bad too, benzos can be bad too, but it, actually some people say they're worse. But I just, you know, whatever combination of things happened, my physically I got out of it okay. Mm-hmm. And I also was lucky in not dealing with cravings very much because I think that's because I had such just a violent, not violent, but like a low physical bottom. Mm-hmm. I don't know, just, whatever. Like my point is that uh, the addiction to negative self-talk was so much harder to break the addiction to hating myself like that's the thing that's the addiction that props up the most frequently in my life today is when times are bad what do i reach for i reach for the bottle of self-hatred yeah because those chemicals haven't leached out of your system like the alcohol yeah 
and that self hatred and, and self you know abuse like that that is just it's poison like alcohol and drugs are poison but I will just it is right there at my fingertips it is right there for me if I want it and it's the hardest thing to put down yeah you are listening to with friends like these with Anna Marie Cox sending flowers has always been the best way to show someone you care but if you're the one doing the sending, it isn't always easy or satisfying. You are lured in with that $19.99 advertised price, but when you check out, it is $94. What happened? There are hidden fees that leave you with a big bill, an even bigger disappointment when the flowers show up looking different than the pictures and they only last a few days. Books.com is a better way to buy flowers. The Books company offers fully transparent pricing, an easy, affordable shopping experience, and an incredible curated selection of flowers starting at $40, including free delivery. But that's a transparent price, $40 with free delivery. There's no those fees and shipping and what do you want to do with this and what do you want to do with that and upselling. They don't do that. Transparent pricing. Each book is sustainably farmed too and it comes straight from the grower to the customer meaning your flowers last longer and cost less to buy their farm fresh flowers are cut fresh and sourced from sustainable eco-friendly farms your flowers last so long your money goes a long way in fact i got some books uh and they came while we were uh traveling and i came back and they were still they were still there they was it was so actually nice to come home to um the cats that are um got to enjoy them before we did, but we enjoyed them for a good long time as well. This year, show every mom in your life you care with flowers from the Books Company. And there is a special offer for my listeners. Order now and get 20% off. Hurry, the flowers will sell out, so don't wait. Just visit books.com and enter code FRIENDS for 20% off your Mother's Day purchase. Again, that's at books, B-O-U-Q-S dot com, code FRIENDS at checkout. And dudes, you could be a better husband or boyfriend or brother or son with a never forget subscription, a regular reminder and delivery for those occasions that tend to slip the male mind. Dates like birthdays and anniversaries. Visit books.com and enter friends for 20% off your Mother's Day purchase. That's books.com, B O U Q S.com, code friends at check Let me ask you this. How do you, how do you feel about, you know, we're, we're in a comfortable studio right now. There's a friendly engineer on the other side of the glass. This is a sunny day. This is all going to go out into the world. Um, how are you feeling about that? Nervous. Um, I do believe that everything happens for a reason. I believe the confluence of events and conversations that brought us to this very moment didn't feel forced everything kind of just sort of happened to line up mm-hmm. and I also feel really strongly that there are people out there who may after listening to this call someone And that's all it takes. I mean, I understand that it takes because it's, it's, these are diseases that are pernicious and you, you're going to need more help than a call. A call is huge. A call is huge and a call is the first step on a long journey. And just to tell someone, <clears throat> like, this is what I am dealing with right now, it is serious and you deserve help. It is serious. If you are thinking about hurting yourself, I, again, I, I had this weird thing where I would be like, well, I don't deserve help because I'm not really serious about it, or I don't deserve help because I should be able to deal with, or I don't deserve help because I don't want to be a drama queen. I, I don't. You deserve help. You deserve it. Yeah. Period. You're a human being. If you are hurting, if you are in pain, there aren't circumstances in which you don't deserve it. 
Exactly. There are none. None. No matter why it is you think, whatever it is you think that you did to deserve this pain, you don't deserve it and you can have help and it is there for you. And there is help. There is help. There is, it, it takes some detective work sometimes and it takes a, a lot of effort and our healthcare system has a lot of problems um, and likely will for a while. But there is, there is help. And, and, you know, I think if people can channel the persistence of this shit that they've been dealing with into a persistence to get better, uh, to, to find that, that help, I think that can go a long way. I mean, I, the way I, when I was, when I was saying goodbye to my brother, when my brother turned into a pile of ashes um, after he died, and, and my sister, my older sister, was carrying the box with his ashes down to the, the boat where we were going to go out on Puget Sound and scatter his ashes. And my mom said, is the box heavy? And my sister said, well, he ain't heavy. <laughs> <laughs> because I believe, I believe that comedy and grief can coexist. Um, but I remember thinking, well, okay, what do we have? You know, we all have to fight this with what we have. I could not go through medical school. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of things I can't do. I can get to a microphone and I can write some things down. I got those skills. I got some friends who are good at talking. And, you know, like, I got some costumes. We got an old barn. Let's put on a show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's, we're all, we all just have to do what we can. And I've been, you know, I figure too, I've been carrying around this shit for so long that why not turn it against itself? You know, why not take all this experience that we've had dealing with this and channel it the other way um, into into trying to, to help people? And, and maybe if someone's listening to this, maybe you don't have access to a, a radio studio and, and some good recording equipment, but maybe you have access to a phone mm-hmm. or maybe you have access to checking in on somebody that you're worried about mm-hmm. and, and just finding out what's going on. And that's that's all any of us can do. The checking in part, I think, is key. And I, I want to distinguish between checking in and feeling responsible for. Yes. Yes. Um, you are not responsible for people's actions. Right. But it, when you're in that place of feeling undeserving and lonely and guilty, reaching out is an action that defies that. Yeah. It is the um, Petronius <laughs> to the to the depression. It's a slap in the yeah. face of the disease. Yeah, it is. It is. Because the disease wants you to be alone and suffer, suffer, suffer. Right. So to reach out to someone, you are actually combating the disease. Yeah. You are. To reach out to someone and to say that they're worth it. And also, I don't want to turn this turn too much into like you know tips, but like... <laughs> To take someone out uh, for coffee or to go to visit someone who's depressed, to just to let them know, like, they don't have to do anything to yeah. deserve your attention and affection. Right. Like, they can just, because what I would be like is, I don't want to go to coffee. I don't want to see you. I don't want to do anything. And, you know, a friend that would say, like, why don't we just watch Bachelor for five hours, you know? Yeah, I'll bring the ice I'll, cream. I'll bring the ice cream. <laughs> that was that's still tempting yeah. <laughs> still totally into it yeah um that it also helps like that is an action too like because it's the it's the care and concern you don't have to say the right thing in fact just talking sometimes i'm not gonna say it makes it worse but like it's not the point right, right. um the, the you're point, not gonna get to the bottom you're of not it. gonna help you're not gonna solve it you know um but to just be there to show with an action that you care about someone and that they deserve help mm-hmm. is, is that's the healing. That's, that's the help that you can really give someone. Um, I also actually, now that I think about it, I'm going to cry again. Like I had a friend um, who would just call me and just get on the phone with me. And I didn't, we didn't, this sounds really strange, but we would watch TV and like not talk. Uh, you'd watch the same show. Yeah. 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 And just to feel like someone's presence. Yeah. Reaching out to me. Again, you are you are slapping the disease in the face. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a, a human connection if you can make one. Yeah. You know, and that's 
and you're not going to find it on your couch. You yeah. know, you've got to you've got to get out of the house sometimes and and try to do it. But uh, however you, this, you, however you heal, you're not going to do it by yourself. That's the yeah. Un, un, that's the nasty truth because your disease would like you to think that you're going to have to do everything by yourself. Yeah. We've been talking on, on – I've been interviewing some of our listeners about the weirdest thing that they've done that actually helps oh, cool. to, to address their depression. One one person plays a ukulele. Another listens to Disney podcasts. Do you have anything like that that mm. is an unexpected aid? Well, I think that tasks that can be absorbing mm. are – are weirdly useful. Yes. Um, they're kind of like a meditation and along those lines. I've become hooked on crossword puzzles. I love crossword puzzles. Those are great. I also knit and crochet. But yep. the weirdest thing, but those are fairly common, but I would say like to volunteer the weirdest part of those habits that I enjoy that help is undoing knots. Really? I've discovered this is actually a little bit of a thing. There's a community, I bet. I, I bet there is. I actually haven't discovered the community, but I've found <laughs> other people that, that share this. Like, so, you know, when you have a lot of yarn and string and mm-hmm. whatever, like, it will get knotted unless you're totally, like, completely organized about it, and I'm not, you yeah. know. And, and so, but there's a part of me that when I see a really nasty knot, like, on my yarn's got a little used, excited. I get a little, I'm like, oh, that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be a tough one. Like, that's going to be a tough one to undo. Woohoo. <laughs> I actually read, I think the way that I know, now I'm remembering why I know this isn't that weird, or it may be weird, but it's not completely unique to me, is there's a Joe Hill novel Mm -hmm. where the um, protagonist, who is also an addict, likes to undo knots. Wow. So, I don't remember how she gets the knots. Like, that is, that's the thing that is, like, I would be if there's like a you know reddit slash yeah you've got to find a friend who loves tying complicated i know (laughs) there must be where i wonder people who are really into this like fetish i wonder like where they get where do you there's somebody that sells knots for like really really the best knots like someone in japan somebody listening to this is emailing us right now (laughs) they just hit send where you get your knots (laughs) Knots knots.com right i yeah there's probably i monetize anything i guess so. that's query farm yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes it's a bonus of doing bonus of being into yarn it's knots knots yeah all right we well i think we want to talk about before we sign off we probably we, we created a lot of content we we have made content we've made highly clickable content the only thing that i want to do that i want to make sure we get to is uh in the spirit of talking about getting help and I'm vamping a little bit here Good. is uh, the, one of my favorite things that, uh, that Google does is if you type in the word suicide the first thing you get National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 1-800-273-8255 that's 1-800-273-8255 it's confidential it's free in the United States uh, also, there is the crisis text um, line, which now I'm going to have to do my Google. Okay. Because I know that it exists. Um, you know, we didn't get to talk about um, the politics of some of the stuff. I, we might have to do that on another show. Yeah. Uh, because as we're doing this, um, I'm reminded that if we lose um, the ban on discriminating against pre existing conditions, Doing things like talking about or mental illness could be used as evidence of having a pre-existing condition. Mm-hmm. So you're on the record, and an insurance company would be able to point to that. Yep. So let's just not do that. Yeah. So call. I will go ahead and say you, if you have an interest in this, you might call your representative. Uh, insurance companies, please plug your ears. Yes. Uh, crisis text hotline. How it works. They're on Twitter. Crisis text line. Great. Um, and that's. A, Whole book and again, whole other show. There's been all these improvements in how people uh, reach out to those who are struggling online. There's a lot of people who are thinking about how to do that. But if you're out there and you're struggling, you can also be the one to reach out yourself. Yeah. It's an amazing thing to do. And even though you are alone, you're not alone. You're in, I mean this in the least you're creepy way You're not as weird as problem. you think you are. This, I don't mean this in the creepy way, but you're not alone. <laughs> like, 
Help is coming from inside the house. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, help is coming from inside the house. <laughs> help is in the back seat of the car with a hook. <laughs> well, Anna Marie Cox. John Mo. Thank you. Thank you. All right. But Sounds I good. really loved being here. Yeah. And uh, we'll do this again sometime. Fight the power. Well, thanks for making it this far in the show. It's uh, more appreciated than usual. And because John and I uh, kind of muffed up our redirects to helplines, I thought I'd repeat them here. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-TALK. Again, that's 1-800-273-TALK-8255. And the crisis text line is available on Twitter, and it is also available via text. If you text HOME, that's H-O-M-E, to 741741 from anywhere in the U.S. at any time, you will receive a text back from a live trained crisis counselor, and they will talk you through whatever it is you're going through. And I want to emphasize here, I used to think, you know what, this isn't that important. This isn't an emergency. I'm not in real trouble right now. You know what, if it feels like an emergency to you, that's enough. If it feels bad to you, that's enough. You can reach out for help with that. And by reaching out for help, you are developing skills that will help you uh, do it again in the future and maybe do it when it is a little more urgent. Sometimes we have to practice reaching out for help. And speaking of reaching out for help, (laughs) allow me to direct you to the other podcasts in the Crooked Media family, which I'm sure you already subscribe to. But if you don't, love it or leave it, which hell, I'm going to need love it or leave it this week for sure. Uh, And DeRay McKesson's new podcast, Pod Save Us All, Tommy Vitor's Pod Save the World, and of course, the granddaddy of us all, Pod Save America. Um, We are all part of the Crooked Media family, and we love to have you listen to all of us. Um, we're a little competitive about it, but um, I think for the most part, we wish each other well. And if you have anything you want to uh, get in touch with me about, you can tweet at the podcast uh, at crooked underscore friends. Um, you can also email the podcast. Uh, the email address is with friends like pod at Gmail. Again, that's with friends like pod at Gmail. You can follow me online at, at Anna Marie Cox. John Moe is at John Moe. And you know what? Again, just thanks for hanging in there. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, you are worth every bit um, of the help that you get. Um, so don't worry. Reach out for help if you need it. It is the first thing you do on the road to getting better. And I will see you along the way. Is depression funny? Yes. How so? Everything is funny. Something wrong with me, I got the sadness I can't shake now. Is there something I can't take now? I'm John Moe, and this is the hilarious world of depression. On this program, we talk to comedians who have dealt with the disease of clinical depression. Comedians make a living talking about things in a way folks can relate to and even laugh about. And if we can laugh at a monster, then we take away some of the monster's power. If we can share something we have in common, we won't feel so alone, and that's when we can start to feel better, which is the goal with any disease, to feel better, to make this gross, heavy thing let up even a little. And it's hard to know how sometimes. Meds work, but not always. Therapy, sometimes, for some people. Exercise, mindfulness, yoga, religion, sure, you you try what you can. Or you self-medicate. Booze, pop, street drugs. You numb yourself up to get out of your own head. Generally, it does not go well. Good, how are you? Good. 
think I see you in person. <laughs> this is Brad from Engineer. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I went to Brooklyn, New York to talk to a comic who has tried a lot of self-medication over the years. Uh, my name is Sam Grittner. Uh, uh, we are currently in my apartment that I share with four lovely roommates in bed Brooklyn. Sam Grittner is a stand-up comedian and comedy writer originally from St. Paul, Minnesota. He was diagnosed with depression as an adolescent and was put on Prozac. He's also been a comedy nerd his whole life. Old stand-up records, Monty Python videos that he watched obsessively. Sam was a middle child and found that getting laughs was a good way to get attention and that he was pretty good at getting laughs. In high school, Sam joined a sketch comedy and improv group. As a freshman, the rest of the people in the group were all seniors. It was a big deal. And the response that he got on stage gave him a high. I would get big laughs. And uh, it was just, it was the first time in my life where I was like, okay, like this, this doesn't only fit, it feels great. And it's, it's healthy, you know, I've done so many drugs in my life and there is nothing better to me. There's no greater high than having a good set or getting an applause break. There's just nothing like it. Um, I don't care if you laugh at my jokes, I've been doing stand up, I need it, uh, please do. Lifeblood. I've been doing stand up comedy for over a decade now though. My dad gave me the best advice that I've ever had when I told him I was going to do stand up. He said, Sam, just remember this, there's no such thing as a bad audience, only sons that should have gone to college. <laughs> Sam says he went off Prozac at age 17 and then started in on other kinds of drugs, beginning with marijuana. I was so curious about everything after I tried pot, because basically in the household I, I grew up in, uh, if you did pot, uh, you were a bad person. And uh, it basically was if you did any drug, you're a bad person. So I found the equivalency of, well, I tried pot, so I'm a bad person. I'm already a bad person, so, well, I'll try cocaine. I'll try ecstasy. And then eventually, uh, I promised myself my, my up in, in my 20s, I said, I, the, the line I will never cross, I will never, never smoke crack, and I will never do heroin. Because that's what, that's what a drug addict does Well, I'm doing Oxycontin in the bathroom of the TGI Fridays and saying, I'm not a drug addict, I'm just, I'm young and having fun. Sam gets out of high school, skips college, gets a day job, and becomes a stand-up around Minneapolis. And around this time, he develops a lingering stomach pain, still has the depression to deal with as well. And so he seeks relief outside the medical establishment. I was uh, very much addicted to opiates on top of the fact that I was smoking pot daily, drinking uh, heavily during work before and after. Um, and then I started, somebody at work turned me on to Percocet and Vicodin, and then I was taking 10 a day, 20 a day, and then eventually they said, well, just, you know, you can do that with this one pill called Oxy. And then they taught me how to suck the coating off and crush it up and snort it, and that way you don't have the time release. And when I started doing that, that was the first time in my 20s that I felt real relief from my stomach pain. And so uh, I did that and then at 24 is when I went to see my, my dealer and he said that the person that they were getting from uh, had to keep start taking them herself uh, because the cancer had spread to the bones in her body and I was like, that is so selfish. And, uh, you know, just such a twisted mind I had. And so he, I was like, well, I need something. And he pulled out uh, some crack and I smoked that. And, you know, I said I'd never do it. And then within five minutes, I folded. And then I was so high, I said, I need something to even me out. Comes back two minutes later with the mirror. And I'm like, a, looks like cinnamon, but uh, I knew it was heroin. And so I sniffed that. And then from that, from 24 to 25, I would use $100, I was spending $200 a day, 100 on each. And I am only alive because I have an aversion to needles. I've never shot up. I would definitely 
have OD'd, given the chance. Sam starts to like the party after the show more than the show. Eventually, he figures, skip the show, let's get right to the party. And before long, Sam Grittner goes from being a comic who uses drugs to a drug addict who used to be a comedian. And though this may not shock you, street drugs don't cure depression. Uh, when I did do drugs, I did heroin. I did heroin for uh, a year and a half straight. I highly recommend not doing it. I lost friends, I lost family, I lost uh, jobs. But the absolute worst part of the entire experience, you guys, I didn't even learn how to play jazz. Once the drugs were gone, I was just, I was still left with all my emotions. And then the fact that I knew deep down I'm just using these to escape, but I didn't want to do the work uh, of going to a therapist, of going to some sort of recovery program, anything like that. 200 bucks a day on drugs is not an easy pace for a comedian in Minneapolis to maintain. You can sign up for only so many credit cards. Sam says he kicked heroin and crack cold turkey, moving in with his parents for two months. And ultimately, he decided that he needed a change of scenery. So he moves to New York to recommit to comedy, sublets a friend's apartment. But, you know, it's not a particular drug that makes you an addict. Having a predisposition to depend on substances makes you an addict. There were 30 bars within, like, a six-block radius from where I was staying. And so, you know, I'd, I'd kicked heroin and I'd kicked crack. And so the addict and alcoholic mind will, of course, bubble up and say, well, since you no longer do those terrible things, and those were terrible things, which is funny. You didn't say that before while I was doing those, but okay. Um, it's fine if you drink. It's fine if you smoke pot. If you want to do cocaine occasionally, if you want to do ecstasy occasionally, all those things are fine. And so I moved here and I said, you know, I'm going to stay sober. After two days, I was drinking. Uh, I was a regular at some bar that I can't even remember the name of. Uh, and then I was smoking pot within four or five months. And then over the last, over the course of the next five years, I would do cocaine, do ecstasy. Um, and that's also, the, I, I slowly cut those out of my life. And then it was just becoming a blackout drunk and smoking pot nonstop. Now for the next several years, Sam works on his comedy and carries around the weight of his addictions. Does stand up, makes videos, works with friends, drinks like a fish, smokes a ton of pot. One day he says he woke up after a blackout drunk binge, having lost 350 bucks in cash from his job waiting tables. And that was it for drinking. Sam has this addictive brain that commands him to do things, which sucks, but he is also able to sometimes take control and make healthier choices, vetoing the addictions, basically. It's kind of a battle between him and his brain. Eventually, he is left with comedy and a steady stream of marijuana and the depression, which hasn't really been fully addressed. We'll get to what happens next in just a moment. The Hilarious World of Depression is supported by Health Partners and by MakeItOK.org. Make It OK is a campaign to start conversations and stop the stigma surrounding mental illness. Not just depression, but all kinds of mental illness. We enjoy having some laughs on this show. It's a way of dealing with depression. It's a way of maybe knocking down the power of depression a bit, but let's not kid ourselves, it's a serious disease. The good news is that people can and do recover if they get help, and that's why we need to make it okay to talk openly. It can be an awkward conversation, but makeitokay.org is full of information you can use, what to say, what not to say, and stories from people who tell you what it's like to live with depression, anxiety, or other mental illnesses. Go to makeitokay.org. You can take the pledge right there to make it okay. Thank you so much to Health Partners and to Make It Okay for joining us and fighting stigma so we can all get better. So, Sam Grittner, comedian, struggles with addiction for years, pills, booze, crack, heroin, gets it all in the rear view mirror, except a whole lot of pot. 
Which brings us to one morning in May of 2016. I believe the day was May 25th. And um, I woke up, I got showered, uh, I was getting ready to go to work. And uh, a voice inside my head, the, the negative voices that I have inside my head, just took over and uh, told me that today was the day that I was going to finally kill myself. I had written suicide notes before. I had two other minor attempts that I would really call cries for help. Um, with pills? Uh, one was, yeah, one was with pills and one with, was with uh, cutting, um, but not to the degree that, that this, this had entailed. I'd done research with Google about how much one needed to take to make sure I didn't wake up. Um, and uh, I won't go into the amounts, but I took copious amounts of uh, Klonopin and Ambien. Where'd you get them? Uh, I was prescribed them at the time, but I had been hoarding them for uh, the last couple months and uh, prior to May. And there was no, the thing that still baffles me is that there was no big trigger for me. And that's, that's, you know, at this point, I'd, I'd stopped drinking three and a half or four years ago. I'd hit a rock bottom and I just made up my mind one day and it stuck. But then I continued to smoke pot. And at the last, for preceding months from, from May backwards, the last eight months, basically, I was smoking pot all day, every day. I'd come home from work and just isolate. It was just my brain it went on autopilot and it said, you know, you've been talking about suicide for years. You hate your life. You, I haven't done anything that's brought me joy uh, in almost a year. And uh, I look around at everybody else and, you know, the brain starts to compare. And uh, I say, you know, all my, all my peers have gotten amazing jobs. And, you know, of course they, they worked for it, they earned it. I don't want to think about that, but... Um, and they're in relationships, and they're they they're acting like normal adults do. And I will never, in my mind, it was you're never going to be happy. You've been unhappy for a very long time. Uh, you don't deserve to be happy. Uh, and so why at this point why stick around? You woke up with this feeling. Yes. And so I texted all of my family members individually. I just said, I love you, which is not out of the norm, which is really scary for how, you know, I didn't want to set it off. I know how, what will raise red flags. And uh, I just sat down on my bed for about 20 minutes debating whether or not I should do it. And then finally I just said, screw it, I'm gonna do it. Here in this apartment in this apartment on that, in my bedroom. So you're on, you're sitting on your bed. You have these sleeping pills that you've hoarded. You want this pain to go away. Do do you ever think in that process, well, I'm not gonna feel relief from this because I'm I'm gonna be dead. I I definitely had those thoughts, but uh, the negative, the negative ones overrided them. Okay. Um, and then, then you took them. With then the I took them. Glass of water. Yep. Yep. I had, I had tried to uh, do it with alcohol about four months prior to that, and that was really a, a bizarre moment for me. I, I was going to. I wrote a note, and uh, I had once again I hoarded pills, and. Uh, I went to, I poured a big, big glass of vodka and I went, I put a bunch of pills in the first round, I guess, in my mouth and I couldn't drink the alcohol. And, uh, Cause you hadn't had any for years by that point. Yeah. And my brain said, once again, it's this really in, weird thing where my brain said, oh, hey, you can kill yourself. That's fine. But you made a promise to yourself that you're never going to drink alcohol again. So you can't do it with this. 
And so I spit out the pills and I realized, it's like, what am I doing? You know, I, I do want to live in this moment. So in this attempt in May, on May 25th, you have the water, you take the pills all at once or are there several rounds that you take? Uh, it took three handfuls. What, uh, what are you thinking after you do that? I was trying not to think about my family uh, because you know that's something that always held me back is that they would have to live with that. And no matter how much I hated myself, I didn't want to do that to them. And I just, I hoped that they would forgive me. Um, and uh, I just, I closed my eyes and I just tried to, try to be at peace, try to make peace with myself. Was the note that you wrote to them? Uh, the, the note four months ago was, was to them, yes. So for this time you didn't write it? I didn't write a note. Why not? I think, uh, my, my brain just said, you know, if, if you write a note, if you, if you raise red flags, that you're gonna convince yourself to stop at some point. You know, the, the seriousness and the reality of the situation will actually hit you instead of just riding this, this wave of fear and guilt and self-hatred and saying, just, just if I don't think about it and I just take the pills and it's just, just stop over. If I think about it, then I'll stop. So I'm just not going to think about the ramifications on other people. I'm just going to do this. So then you fall asleep. I fall asleep. And then six hours later, I wake up. What was that like? That is still the most surreal experience of my life. And my first thought was, fuck, I managed to screw up my suicide attempt. This is, this is, and I, then my second thought was, well, I've been talking about my suicide note on stage and it's been getting great response. So the second thought in my, in my head was actually, was literally, well, at least you got more suicide material. And then the third thought was, uh, I need help. And uh, I called my therapist and actually I tried, no, that's not true. I tried to start to try and cover it up. I called my job and I said, I'm sorry I didn't come into work today. I had suicidal thoughts um, and I'm fine. Now, mind you, my speech is slurred. Uh, I started smoking pot after I woke up too. Uh, so I'm stoned and I'm, you know. Why, just, why did you reach for the pot? Oh, well, I, I, knew, I knew what was gonna happen, which was I was gonna end up going to a, a hospital and most likely I was gonna get checked into a psych ward. My, I, I'm smart enough to, to know that. And so my user brain says, well, if I'm gonna do that, there's no way I'm not gonna finish the rest of the sour diesel that I paid good money for. And also, just to minimize the situation. You know, to if I smoke, to dull it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I called my boss up and he's this great, great guy. And he says, you know, all I need from you is a, a note from your therapist that says you're, you're okay and able to come back to work. And so I, I said, okay, boss, you got it, hang up. Call my therapist and say, uh, I don't need you to ask any questions. I just need a note from you that says I'm mentally, my faculties are, are okay. Uh, I, I'm good to work. You just need to give me a note that says I'm good to go to work. Don't ask me any questions, professional therapist. Yes, yes, which uh, oddly enough raised some red flags with her. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And she said, what are you on? What happened? And I just, I gave up. I said, I, I took all the pills that I hoarded and she called my psychiatrist, my psychiatrist. I, so it was this weird phone tag with them for about 15 minutes where they said, you need to go to a hospital. If you don't, we're gonna call an ambulance. And uh, I said, I'm going right now. And I stayed and once again, I was just trying to finish my pot because I knew I most likely wasn't going to be able to do it again. 
uh, when I came out. And then uh, about 15 minutes passed, and I hear a knock on my door, and it's two of New York's finest. And they, I open up the door, and I just put on my best game face, and they go, we're here for the suicide attempt. And I go, gentlemen, wonderful to see you. Uh, I'm the only one here. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I reek like pot, and I'm probably slurring my speech, but for, they believe me. And they go, well, do you have any idea, you know, is it another apartment? And I said, well, you might want to check on the, the first floor. And there's some guys down there, you know, that are there, they play music, and so you know those artist types. And so they went downstairs, and then they eventually went outside. And the reason I lied to them was because I had to pay out of pocket for an ambulance ride before, and it was $1,000. And so I said, well, I'm going to, so I said, I'm not going to do that. I will somehow make it to a hospital in my cra in this crazy mindset that I had. So I smoked one more bowl, and I looked out the side and I kept waiting, and once I saw that they, the cops weren't looking my direction, I ran down the stairs, ran to the G, and somehow, I, it took me seven attempts trying to swipe my card the right way, and somebody had to help me. To get on the subway. Yeah, and I had used my app, my, you know, the app on my phone to, uh, Mount Sinai was the closest one. And so I'm just in this boggled mind state, just the foggiest mind state I've ever been in. And somehow I transferred to, to, to the L, and uh, I checked myself in there, and they, uh, they didn't pump my stomach, which was very odd to me. They said that it had been so long that it had metabolized by mm, now. Nothing to pump out yet. Yeah, nothing yeah. to pump out. And so I spent two hours, and then, then I realized that, yeah, they're, they took away my phone. Said, okay, they're going to put me in the psych ward. Involuntary commitment. Yes, involuntary commitment. And then what happened? And then they put me in the psych ward. I, I, uh, I got checked in. I had to wait about six to eight hours in a, in a holding unit. People that were screaming and it was really cold, not a fun experience. Uh, and then they brought me up to, I think it was the eighth floor uh, for the Mount Sinai psych ward. And they took away my, my, my sh shoelaces and my, my regular clothes. They took away everything I had and I got a green jumpsuit and uh, got a bed and uh, you know there are no locks on the doors there there are no there's nothing metal so you can't cut anyone or yourself after you woke up and before you got checked into the hospital there's a lot of ways you could have killed yourself between there there and the hospital you could have jumped off the building you could have jumped in front of a train why didn't you that's that's a really good question um, and what, it, what I do keep coming back to in my life that I live now is that I don't know why I lived, but there has to be some reason. And the, the fact that I woke up after, after that attempt. And then there's also, I mean, to be perfectly honest, it's like, well, I, I screwed up that, you know, if I jump off the building, someone, it's going to be somebody walking along with a trampoline. Like, I just, I will mess it up. Um, but also, yeah, deep down, you know, I, I, like I said, I was, I was ignoring any voices that were saying, or any part of my mind that was saying, you, you should live, you need to live, you want to live. If not for you, do it for your family for right now. Think about what you're going to do to others. Um, and so when I came to, you know, there was some semblance of, some part of reality was saying, hey, you do want to live deep down deep, deep down underneath all this hate that you've buried and denied for so long. There, there is, there's that and there's something higher. There's so, something with the universe is at play here. What did the doctors say when you told them how much you had taken and survived? They told me unequivocally that I should have died. How did that make you feel? It made me it just keeps going back to that same question is that, that I, I shouldn't be here, but I am. And so there's, there's a reason for that. And being in the psych ward the first two days, I was 
trying to, you know, I'm a huge fan of Breaking Bad, and I love the idea that they write these shows with these scenarios that are impossible to break out of, and then they work their way, their way backwards from them. And so I'm saying, what, what would Walter White do in this situation? And trying to figure out how to escape. Somehow. It's always a healthy question to ask yourself. <laughs> what would Heisenberg do? <laughs> what would one of the most horrible characters in television do in this situation? Were you trying to escape from it? Were you trying to get out of it? I was actively trying to, uh, trying to figure out how I could. Um, but after, after two days, I surrendered. I, I, you know, there's only so long that uh, you can bullshit yourself. How long were you in the hospital? I was in the psych ward for 12 days, and um, I, in retrospect, I'm so happy I was there. I probably would have tried to hurt myself again, um, or I definitely would have started using hardcore substances again. That was, that was in the back of my mind too, was, well, maybe I should try and figure out where I can cop some heroin and you know, get enough that I know I won't wake up from that. Um, and being in the psych ward, I realized, um, I started for the first time in, in my entire life uh, saying, I, I want to live, I have value, I deep down actually do love myself, and I'm here for some purpose, and I, d I don't know what that is, but it's, it's been made abundantly clear to me from, from doctors, from my attempts, from previous times when I took so many drugs that I, I, I should have overdosed. Uh, I'm here for some reason, and, and ultimately, I deserve happiness. Sam wrote about all of this a couple months later in an essay on Medium.com entitled Dying to Live. It's a painful read, but it also feels like a man being relieved of a tremendous weight. Sam says he's had no pot since this all went down. He's in recovery for that. He's had no alcohol, no other drugs, and he's been working harder than ever at his comedy. And he's trying to use everything he's learned since that day in May. I, I was really depressed the last two days, and that's the thing was I hit this milestone and I thought I was gonna be really happy. And then, you know, I still get depressed. I, I was really, really depressed the last two days. And then I didn't use the stuff that I've been taught and have been utilizing over the past couple of months. The techniques. The techniques, which primarily, it's getting out of my head. And so I do that by, by texting people, by calling people by literally getting just out of my apartment gets me out of my head more than anything else. Going for a walk, doing self-care. All the things that drugs used to do for you. Exactly. You know, just listening to music, getting a smoothie, watching a movie. Have you figured out what that purpose is that you keep talking about or why you're still alive? The, the closest that I can get to is that you know, you had mentioned, I, I've had the piece on Medium about the suicide attempt, and then I also have one about the suicide note, which was a, a funny thing happened while I was typing my suicide note, which was, I, for 20 minutes, I was trying to figure out what the appropriate font was for a suicide note, which is... Comic Sans. <laughs> that's what many people, it seems to be the consensus. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, so when I published both of those, I got overwhelmed with my inbox uh, from emails and my, my direct message on Twitter is open and uh, from people who either directly have, have depression and, and substance abuse problems or have lost a family member to it. Um, but the thing that really has hit home, and I guess I'll, I'll talk about this publicly for the first time, is that after the, I published the, the suicide note essay, I, the very next morning, got an email from a gentleman who was 17 years old in Arizona who told me that he was going to kill himself that night and that he had read my essay. And that the essay moved him enough that he told his parents 
what he was suffering from. And, and, uh, excuse me, um, and he ended up getting help. And he, uh, he's healthy today and he's sober and he is, he has a therapist that he sees on a regular basis. And I've received four more emails like that. And I, I don't care what I do with the rest of my life. That's more than I could. Have. I'm sorry. That's that's more than I could have ever hoped to do with my life. Sam is saddled with this addict's brain. That's just the brain that he got. That's why addicts never say I'm cured. They say I'm recovering. Ing gerund currently in process. It's why addicts say, I won't drink today because tomorrow is going to be a decision made at that time. Sam says he has hard days, but a lot of good days as well. As for what's next, he's working on some book ideas with a literary agent, and he's going on stage to get that original high, telling jokes. Um, my favorite thing to do now is to talk about suicide on stage. Um, in a way that certainly doesn't romanticize it, but uh, but destigmatizes it. The fact that I'm able to talk about a subject that is still there are very few subjects that are taboo that are left in our culture, and mental health is mental health and and uh, being addicted to substances and alcohol. I think are the the two biggest ones. And being able to talk about those on stage and make people laugh while thinking about it is is just a, an amazing, amazing feeling and and thing to do. I feel like I'm I'm doing service. Here's Sam in October of 2016. And uh, so then I was like, okay, uh, I'm gonna kill myself. I was like, oh fuck, I haven't done the dishes in a week. Like if my roommates <laughs> discover me, they're gonna be like, on top of the dishes, he can't even clean up after himself. Who is this fucking guy? Fuck this. And so then I, I went on to Orbit. <laughs> and uh, well, actually, before that, I went to go and print out my. This is true. I went to print out my suicide note. The printer cartridge died as I'm printing it out. And I was like, that's so selfish. <laughs> and the irony was completely lost on me. So I went to Best Buy. I got a new cartridge. And I come back and I print out the notes. It's all legible. And it's in Comic Sans. And, um, and uh, I go into Orbit. And I'm like, you know. Where, where should I kill myself? I'm like, well, you only get to kill yourself once, Sam, so why don't you treat yourself, huh? And so I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna kill myself at the Waldorf Astoria. And then I looked at my bank account and I realized that I couldn't afford to kill myself at the Waldorf Astoria. And so I did more research and I found out the best I could do was the Holiday Inn Express in Queens. And that just made me more depressed, but in a different way. Do you work for Holiday Inn Express, or are you just Red Roof people? I don't know what's going on over here. Queens. Oh, Queens! Is that a good place to kill yourself, just out of curiosity? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the more you know. We're <laughs> learning here. Um, so I uh, ended up having a friend, and I called a friend, and I decided that I would rather die on stage than kill myself. So that's the end of that story. Um, so yay for me not killing myself. The Hilarious World of Depression is a production of American Public Media. Chrissy Pease is our producer. Our executive producer is Kate Moose. Special thanks to Jonathan Blakely. We got engineering help from Brad Fisher. Our technical director is Corey Shreppel. Our theme song, Pagliacci, was written and performed by our good friend Rhett Miller. You should listen to all of Rhett's music that you can because it is great. RhettMiller.com. If you need immediate help, confidential help is available for free. Call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. The Hilarious World of Depression is supported by Health Partners and MakeItOK.org. That's a campaign to start conversations and stop the stigma around mental illness. 
makeitokay.org has information to check out for yourself or for someone else. Starting a conversation about mental illness can be awkward. It can be difficult. Make It Okay has tips on what to say, what not to say. It has stories of hope from people who have been there. Visit makeitokay.org. You can take the pledge to make it okay. Next week, legendary talk show host Dick Cavett tells us about some unexpected treatments for depression that he was recommended in college. I went to the Yale Infirmary where a nice lady who seemed like a kind of friendly librarian suggested that I walk more and use an oral B40 toothbrush. <laughs> so I was in expert hands. I'm John Moe. Bye now. says doc that's the problem what if i was to tell you i'm payachi this great big smile is just for show what if is I depression was funny tell you th- oh that's right i don't really have a guest this time per se so i get to answer that one myself yes depression is funny in the same way that a sewer rat driving a car is funny. It's gross and smelly and it's not gonna take care of the car. The car is headed straight for a tree. It's a big disaster. But then again, you know, it's a rat driving a car. So that's kind of funny. Take it away, Rhett Miller song. Says there's something wrong with me. I got a sadness I can't shake now. Is there something I can't take now? It's the hilarious world of depression, placebo edition. I'm John Moe. That was music from Rhett Miller just there. The song's called Pagliacci. You can find Rhett online at rhettmiller.com. During the month of March 2017, our show, along with many podcasts and public radio organizations, is celebrating something called Tripod. No, not the thing you put a camera on. This tripod is spelled with a Y, T-R-Y, pod. It's clever wordplay. Uh, Those two words, of course, sound identical to the ears, but they're spelled differently and they mean different things. So it's very, very complicated. I think it's meant more for social media hashtag tripod. That's what you're supposed to use. That's what I want you to use because it's an effort to get people to try pod, as in podcasts. Try them. Give them a shot. And we're really hoping that people try them who've never tried them before. So what you might want to do is find some podcast that you like. Uh, doesn't have to be this one. It can be this one. But, you know, all sorts of podcasts that you like. And then suggest them to a friend using that hashtag tripod. Maybe you can help somebody who never listens to podcasts finally get into the whole spirit of the thing. Teach them how to download them, that kind of thing. Hashtag tripod. So today we're going to have you try a different pod. Terrible Thanks for Asking. It's made by the same company as us, American Public Media. And it's about the real answers that people would give if they were honest when someone asks, how are you? Terrible Things for Asking even came out around the same time as our show. Yep, together they're the feel-bad hits of the winter. Okay, so I'll be back in a couple weeks with another placebo edition of The Hilarious World of Depression. And for now, try this pod cast. A quick warning that this episode contains references to suicide plus some strong language. And I remember people saying, like, my voice had changed that they could hear something in my voice. And I was like, is it death? That's what I feel, so maybe they're hearing it. This is terrible. Thanks for asking. The show where we ask people to give their honest answers to the question, how are you? I'm Nora McInerney, and this is Danielle. I am 31, I'm a mother of two. I am a lover, I am a freedom fighter. I am an empath to the fullest degree, and I'm a postpartum depression and anxiety survivor. And this is Danny Starr. I, I know I 
keep talking about this, but I'm seriously thrilled that we are creeping up to Thanksgiving and not a snow flurry. The sun is shining on my way in today. I'm like, I seriously don't even want to talk about it because I feel like I'm going to bring the snow. But it's not snowing. The sun is shining. Happy Tuesday. For years, Danielle's job was to be Danny Starr. Danny Starr was the host of a popular radio morning show in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Danielle woke up every day before dawn, drove to a studio, switched on a microphone, and became Danny Starr. It was Danny's job to entertain an entire city of sleepy humans as they went from their homes to their jobs. Danny bantered with her co-hosts, she played pop music, delivered celebrity gossip, She interviewed the star she'd grown up listening to. I mean, she met the Backstreet Boys. I was excited as hell. You know, I started off talking for a living, and I love to talk, so it was really cool to be getting paid for what I love to do. And life is good. It's so good, you know, and I can't imagine doing anything else. And I'm good at it. And finally, I feel like I'm in the space that I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing, because... This is right, it all fits, it makes sense. Danielle has been Danny Starr for a decade. And for a long time, they were the exact same person. Danny shared all of Danielle's life on the radio. Relationships, breakups, falling in big love and getting married, and eventually, her pregnancy. Danielle was happy. She had everything she ever wanted. She had plans for her future, And that future was going to be just as fantastic as it had been since she started being Danny Starr. I had known forever that I wanted to be, I think in high school everyone knew like I was gonna be a mom, like that was it. Um, I said I wanna be a mom, I knew I was gonna do some other things but ultimately I knew that I wanted to be a mom so I was super excited, I plotted the pregnancy, I knew that we wanted to have a baby. Like there was nothing during the pregnancy that made me paranoid to be a mom made me think like, oh, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I, it's This was the one thing I knew I couldn't fail at. And then I had this little baby, and the very next day I remember trying to get this tiny little thing into an outfit that <laughs> didn't fit because she was so little, and I struggled with it. And I just remember feeling like, I don't want to do any of this. I don't want this baby, I don't want this life. And it was just instant, it just set in. And then I thought, oh, this is normal, it's the baby blues, you know, don't don't panic yet. Talked to my midwife, I said, I'm crying on the phone, literally in the hospital, like, I can't do this, she's so little. She's like, you're gonna be okay, everything's gonna be fine. The baby blues are common. I mean, they're a common phrase at least, you've heard it before, I'm guessing. I know I had. Babies are a lot of work, so yes, they make you tired and they can be overwhelming. And something like 80% of women have the baby blues after giving birth. But they're supposed to go away after a few weeks. They're just temporary. Now, Danielle had done her homework on pregnancy. I went to every baby class. And she thought she'd prepared for everything. You know, swaddling a baby had that down. You know, I knew how to breathe hypnobirthing, all kinds of crazy meditation things to get me through, you know, actually birthing this child. But I think the most important thing that was missing from all the education that I learned was protecting my mental health. But Danielle left her conversation with her midwife feeling like these feelings would pass, that she'd be okay. And I believed that for a second, but then when I got home, it was like the beginning of the end. I knew I just didn't feel right. There was no excitement anymore. And like I said, I spent an entire pregnancy excited. Um, And then it gradually, so it, it, the onset was quick, but then the, the deep, deep darkness. And and that's what I refer to it as uh, when I talk about this time in my life, I always talk about the darkness. Um, And, but the deep darkness that came kind of gradually, but every day was worse than the day before. And something else happened to make me a little more paranoid, a little less secure in, oh, you're a good mom. You know, it, it, it got to the point where I just didn't want to do it at all. I wanted no part of it. I think for me it was, I, I knew 
babies shouldn't cry and baby needed to be changed and I feed baby. But then there was like so little sleep that, okay, Salvador Dali, you know, the painter. So Salvador Dali, he did not sleep a lot, right? He actually held a spoon in his hand and when the spoon fell out, um, that's when he would decide, you know, he was gonna wake up. That's why all his paintings look like morphed into each other. He was partially insane because he didn't sleep. That's essentially postpartum depression. You don't sleep at all. And though you're not holding a spoon in your hand, there's so little sleep that things start to morph together. I didn't see real reality. Everything looked like a Salvador Dali painting. And so it was really difficult to navigate myself through that life. All I remember is baby shouldn't cry. So robotic me sitting on the couch, here's baby cry. I get up, I go over, I, you know, I, I help baby, I feed baby, I sit back down. But there's no love, there's no emotion, there's none of that. And then when I am awake at this point because I'm not sleeping at all, my thoughts gravitate towards what if, what if this world is better without me because I don't feel love for this human I just produced, so I must be bad. I must not be good. I'm not anything because how can you give birth to this beautiful human and see everyone cooing and eyeing over this beautiful baby and you feel nothing? Oh, because you're not good, you're evil and you shouldn't be here. Like literally it goes from zero to a hundred so quickly and there is no scaling it back. You have absolutely no control over it. And, and in this frame of mind, it doesn't seem crazy to you. You know, talking to you now, I can tell you none of this was logical, but in the moment, me counting sleeping pills because I just wanted to sleep and thinking, okay, I don't think I'm gonna die. And let me just try to Google how many I can take to knock me out for a couple of days, but maybe not die. Like that's not normal. But in that mind frame, I was like, I, I don't really care. I just need to sleep, you know, not thinking about anything else. So it, there's no logic. There's, there's nothing. Um, it just hits you, it hits you hard. And if you're one of the lucky ones, you survive. Danielle kept that to herself. Because what kind of a mother didn't like motherhood? And what kind of a happy, energetic morning show host with hundreds of thousands of fans and followers shares that kind of darkness when she's supposed to be spreading sunshine and celebrity gossip? So Danielle clawed her way through the darkness, sleep deprived, anxious, and empty. And Danny Starr still woke up at 4.30 in the morning to entertain her city every day. Your daily gossip, gossip starts now. This is Danny's Dish. Hot, hot, hot new couple alert. Ryan Gosling and Ava Mendez, who just filmed a movie together, were seen taking their romance off screen at Disneyland, holding hands. I went back to work really early. I, I worked from home. Um, we set up a makeshift radio studio in my living room. So I was literally a couple days out which probably added to it, to be honest. Baby on boob, microphone on, talking maybe three days after giving birth. Um, I had this pressure, you know, I, I was a female radio person in a male-dominated industry, and they were like, where is she at? And it doesn't sound the same, and there was this pressure, and even though, you know... It's competitive, you want to keep your spot. Yes, and... I wanted to make sure my kids were good. I was the breadwinner. I wanted to make sure we were safe. And so I, I worked while dealing with this horrible thing. It was just so complicated. Danielle wasn't eating or sleeping or even showering. She could feel herself slipping further and further into the darkness. But Danny Starr was fine because Danny Starr had to be fine. So I met. At the time, I'm sitting in my living room, which is a makeshift studio. I have a baby on my lap. There's a microphone sitting in front of me. It's dark in my house because it's four in the morning. And then you hear music and you hear like fun and laughter. And then you have to like start talking. It's, wow. At the darkest time in my life, I still had to make other people happy. Imagine that, right? I felt, felt like I was dying and I had to laugh at dumbass jokes. 
and I contemplated suicide and had to laugh at dumbass jokes. <laughs> and then um, I had to pretend like all of this was normal. But I remember when I would click the microphone off, I just remember my body, like I felt like my body could crumble into the ground. Like I would sit up to project and, and I would sit up to, to make it come out. And then the moment the microphone went off, it was like my shoulders slumped and my whole body just kind of crumpled into itself because I just, it was so bad. It just didn't feel good. I just wanted to not be doing it. The great pretender, like literally. It was, it was literally living a double life. Because if you listened to the show, you probably would have had no idea. But meanwhile, my house was dark, my body was cold, my mind was paranoid all the time. Like there, was, there was no reality that was safe in that space. And as the depression dug in deeper, days turned into weeks. And it wasn't just herself that Danielle started to doubt. I was paranoid about everything. I thought that uh, my husband at the time, I believed that he was going to kidnap our baby. He's from St. Lucia, and so I believed he was going to take our baby to another country. And in fact, when she was three months old, we traveled to St. Lucia, and he accidentally forgot my passport. So postpartum me in the airport knows right now for a fact that he's kidnapping my child, which is, of course, why he forgot, you know, my passport. I'm having a heart attack. I'm calling my sister. I, I'm telling her, I'm, I told you this is real. He, he did this on purpose. We don't even have my, it's my maiden name on my passport, which means I don't even have, they, they can't even prove this baby's mine because they share the same last name on their passports. So they're going to let him leave with this baby and I'm going to be here by myself. And this was his plan all along. And in that tiny 20 minutes of panic for this passport, all of that went through my head that quickly. And now, no, he wasn't trying to steal our baby. But the entire trip, I thought he was going to push me over cliffs to keep her. I, you know, do you want to go on a hike? Hell no. You go on that hike by your damn self. Because I know what's coming. You know, I know how this ends. Like, literally, that's where my mind was the entire time. It was somebody's going to kill me. It's probably going to be him. He's going to marry my best friend because that's what they wanted to do all along. And they're going to raise my baby. Gosh, this is... And this is also when you... I, I can tell you because I have the brochure, the postpartum depression brochure in my house. That is not, not what's described. I mean, you know, there's, it's very, they keep it very vague. And did you feel like this was the kind of thing that you could talk to, you know, your friends about or your family about or your doctor about? No, because it seemed in my mind that it was normal, even though it wasn't. And then when I started to realize that some of it wasn't normal, well, first of all, the problem with the brochure is that any woman reading that, if you feel any level of craziness above that, you're probably going to be like, hell no, I can't talk about this because this brochure said it, this is what happens. And I'm, you know, wanting to jump off bridges or do these types of things. So we probably shouldn't have this conversation. I remember going to my appointment and they actually did give me, um, you know, the survey. Are you eating, are you sleeping, are you, do you have harmful thoughts, all these things. And I'm sitting there, and there are yeses to most of these really negative questions, like, do you want to kill yourself? Eh, yeah, probably. Um, do you want to harm your baby? Not really, but if she starts crying a lot, probably. Like, I literally was in that mind frame, but I'm circling no on all of these things because I know, logically, I'm not supposed to say yes to this. Like, what happens then? So now I'm here, you're asking me these questions, you're gonna take my baby. And even though I'm not super connected to this baby, I know she's mine and everything else feels out of control. So the only thing that I have is her. And so you don't tell, you don't, you don't want to tell the truth. I, I have, I'm so open. I'm extremely public. I talk about everything. I'm an overshare by nature. It's just who I am. And that was the one time in my entire life I wanted nobody to know any part of what I was going through. And it's crazy. Like I suffered in silence for so long and nobody 
you know, I, I have a lot of medical professionals. My best friend Claire is a nurse. She didn't understand it. I remember really distinctly feeling ill-equipped. This is Claire. Like, I don't know how to help somebody in this situation. I don't know what to do. And I spent a lot of time trying to convince her to get help, which I now realize is really futile because she was very incapacitated and really struggling to have any motivation and ownership over her own life. And I'm telling her to do something, to get help, to get help, not realizing that she actually couldn't. Danielle was so convinced that her husband was going to take the baby from her that she started hatching an escape plan from their home and from her life. I had stashed baby products in one area, a ba- like a you know overnight bag, some things that I would need in my breast pump. Um, and when he left, he said, I'm going to the store, I'll be back. I said, okay. He left, I watched him pull away, and my mind went into fight or flight. And I packed up the car, I went over to my grandpa's house, I turned all the lights off because it was in an area that I knew if the lights were on, someone would say, oh, someone's over there. I mean, I was in complete darkness for, you know, 14 days. Danielle's grandpa was in a nursing home, so she and the baby had the place to themselves. It was a perfect hiding spot. It was silent, which gave me a lot of time to be in my crazy mind and plot funerals. And, you know, I buried every single, in those 14 days, I buried every single person that I really loved. Um, I could tell you eulogies for my best friend, for my brothers, because for whatever reason, all I could think of was death. I literally planned funerals for 14 days. I planned funerals. I um, thought about my own life and death and the things I've, I had done wrong and how they were so wrong that I really didn't deserve to live. And then how could I take care of this baby because I'm bad and all I think about is death and she's life and it doesn't make sense. And I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping. It, it, it was just, it was dark. And, and I don't mean dark as in I closed the shades and had all the lights off. I did, it was dark literally. But it was also dark as in cold and uncomfortable in my own skin. And I don't mean when you're sitting around someone and you feel like a little self-conscious. I mean my skin hurt, like being me hurt. It was painful. It was, I didn't like me. I didn't like um, the way I sounded. I didn't like the way I breathed. I didn't like the way my skin felt on my body. Everything was wrong. Everything was wrong and mostly everything was wrong with me. And I think for me, the hardest part about postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety was the judgment I had for women that actually killed their babies. Um, I remember like being so naive and judgmental back then, like, well, how could these, you know, Andrea Yates and like just women who these horrible stories came up, right? And I would think, well, there's a special place in hell for them. Like instantly, just not a question. And here I am counting sleeping pills, ready to kill myself and my kid. And I realized, oh shit, no, there is not a special place in hell for them. They're living in hell, like actually. Cause I, had it have continued any longer than it did, I 100% believe I wouldn't be sitting across from you doing this interview. I, it just wouldn't have happened. <laughs> Thank God my baby wasn't a crier because I'm going through this. And if she was a crier, we wouldn't survive because it, that's very overwhelming. A baby crying is overwhelming. I think Especially. people don't understand that. Like you were talking about these stories where people like harm a baby. It is like having a broken doll. Yeah. It's like having a broken computer program. And you're like, I know I'm supposed to love this. And it is, imagine how frustrated you get when like, you know, you're, you can't get like cell phone service or like a text won't send and how uh-huh. people like throw fits over that. You're yeah. like, you are holding this thing and you don't know the code to it. Right. And it won't turn off. And you're supposed to know and the code. you're supposed to know the code. it you're, came from you. Yeah. And you're like, I don't know. I'm, like, I'm going to pat you like this. I'm going to try to feed you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it can be hours. Yeah.
I mean, I had a short list of places where she could be, but when she wasn't at her mother's, and I was trying to think of where the places would be, and her grandfather's didn't pop in my mind right away because he was actually in a nursing home. Danielle's family and friends knew that she was safe and the baby was safe, but nothing else. She'd reply to texts with terse and cryptic messages. We're fine, leave us alone. But she was not fine. And eventually, her best friend had had enough. I think I got to my own point of desperation. She was in her point of desperation and I got there too because I was worried that she was gonna hurt herself. I think that I could have stayed there forever. I really do. Um, But Claire was very adamant about not my safety anymore because she knew I didn't care about my own safety at this point. She was really concerned about my baby. And she sent a text message and she said, I'm saying this out of love, I love you. You're not gonna help yourself. I'm gonna make sure you get help. You're not giving me enough information. I don't know where you are. And I did threaten to call the police. So I finally told her where where I was. Um, and then she sent Jill, who's a nurse. And when Jill pulled up, I remember, you know what's weird is that I actually remember kind of a sense of relief. Um, but also, get the hell out of here. It was like a push and pull. Like, I really want you here, but look at me. I, 14 days of not showering, not eating, not sleeping. Like, I did not, it was not a pretty sight, you know? So when Jill got in there, um, I think I was expecting more anger from Jill. Like, how could you run away? And how could you take this baby and put yourself in danger and your baby in danger? And I think what I wasn't expecting was the level of compassion. And she sat down and she instantly picked up the baby. And I remember, I remember when she was holding the baby, how happy she looked and like how she, um, she said things that I hadn't even thought, like she's so beautiful and you know, she's amazing. And I remember thinking, oh shit. That's how I'm supposed to feel. What is this? Like, what am I feeling? I've never even looked at my baby and thought, you're beautiful. And she was. She's cute as hell. So I I don't know. I think that at that moment, I, I just was like, help me. This isn't who I am. Like, who? I don't know who this person is. I don't recognize her. And I'm going to hurt myself. Like, I need help. Danny and Jill got up and walked out of that dark house, but not out of the darkness. And going back, going back home was really difficult because just because I knew something was wrong with me, I didn't know I knew how to fix it, you know? You can, you can know things all day long. If you don't have a plan in, in, in motion to get back to who you are, you're just someone who's aware something is wrong, no plan of action. So they worked at it. They got a name for it, postpartum depression. The stronger, more ruthless cousin to the baby blues. The one that won't go away in a couple of weeks and that can take away your ability to cope. They named it and they developed a plan to fight it. I saw a therapist weekly. I met with my midwife more often. There were so many people in and out of the house at all times because it really wasn't safe for me to be by myself. And then once I actually admitted to my midwife what was happening and we started working through it, she actually asked me to talk about it. She said that, um, you know you talk about everything, right? I said, yeah, of course I do. She goes, you're not talking about this. I said, yeah, I know. It's weird, right? And she goes, why? I said, I don't know. Well, because it's easy to see if someone has a broken arm. It's easy to see if somebody, you know, has a black eye. You know, it's easy to see those things. I, you couldn't see what I was going through and so I didn't think people would understand, um, which comes to, into play, the mental health stigma, obviously. But um, I was scared that because you couldn't see my wounds, people wouldn't, one, believe them or try to understand them. 
And then again, I was scared about judgment. I, I mean, look how I felt about the women who killed their babies. And here I am telling you that I want to kill mine or myself, you know, like what comes with that? Opening yourself up to that craziness, you know? So what happened was I had to really think about it. And what kind of played in my head many times was, was to who much is given, much is required, right? And I have been very blessed to be given a platform that other people haven't. And people have literally followed me since I was 19 years old. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. So why, if I'm in the worst situation in my life and I had to suffer through it alone, would I ever allow anybody else to do that? So I posted one post Danielle wasn't sure how Danny Starr's fans would react to this confession. Because postpartum depression had happened to Danielle quietly, off the air. And sharing it with Danny Starr's fan base felt scary and a little dangerous. This isn't like sharing a post on your Facebook page where your friend's ex-boyfriend's best friend that you met at a party once might make a weird comment that you can delete. Danny Starr has over 150,000 fans across social media. Fans who didn't know what had happened after the pregnancy Danny was so excited about. Just that she had disappeared for a while. But that's what new moms do. It's called, like, maternity leave. But Danielle couldn't help but think. Would she be judged the way she had judged other women before she'd endured this kind of pain? And I had no idea how many women suffered like I did. The response to her post was an overwhelming outpouring of women who had experienced postpartum depression or were in the throes of it. Women who were grateful to Danny for sharing her experience. Women who needed help. Women who raised their hands to say, me too. Danielle was overwhelmed, humbled, and pushed into action. She had a platform, all those social media followers. She had something to say that wasn't about celebrities and pop music and she was going to use it. I spent hours upon hours upon hours responding to women who were in the same place that I was, who had nobody to talk to, who didn't tell their husbands, their partners, their family members, and they were emailing me. And I instantly tell them that it is going to be okay. Because I think when you're in the darkness, you can't see the other side. When you're in the thick of it, all that matters is that moment. And so you don't see beauty on the other side of it. Everything that they are feeling in that moment, the opposite is on the other side. And that's usually where I go to. I know you're feeling worthless, but you're worthy. I know you're cold, but it's warm over here and you can get here. I'm here, like I hear you, I see you, I feel you, because I think you feel invisible during that time. And that's, that's isolating as hell, you know? I understand this isolation this darkness. I didn't have words for it when Ralph was first born. My husband was sick with brain cancer. He had brain surgery just weeks before our son was born. And when I got out of the hospital, I had two people to take care of. My darkness was different from Danielle's, but it was darkness. I wasn't overwhelmed with love at the sight of my son. I was just overwhelmed. He was a small alien that was inhabiting my life. When he needed me, I took away from my sick husband. I took good care of him, but I never felt like I was good at it, like I was a natural. It took time for me to fall in love with him. And when I finally did, all I felt was guilt over how long it took me. How other moms were better at it than I was. How another woman would have appreciated this baby I prayed so hard for. A lot of women feel like Danielle felt during her pregnancy, that we were born to do this, that for whatever reason, we can't fail. I felt this way at least. And I think I felt this way because everyone around me had made it look so easy. Every Facebook post, every Instagram photo I saw projected this peaceful, grateful view of motherhood, that it was a blessing 
that it was to be savored and treasured. That all the sleepless nights and the milk-stained clothes and the leaky boobs are moments to be appreciated. That even the challenges of motherhood are somehow enjoyable because this is what we signed up for. Like, when you don't feel that way, when the hard parts of motherhood are just hard, you feel like you're failing twice. I didn't think of this as postpartum depression. I didn't think of it at all, because between a cancer patient and a newborn, I was the least important person in our household. My needs were nowhere near the top of my list of priorities. I didn't ask for help. I, in fact, turned down help because I believe the most important thing a mother could be is capable. I may not have wanted to take care of my baby, but I had to do it. And I had to do it on my own because that's what moms do, right? You know, it takes a village, right? That used to be the saying, and you need to build your village while you're pregnant. You have to call on your people. I found, during this whole thing, I found that people really struggle asking for help. Not me. I need help. I need all the help. I need hands on, all hands on deck. And I learned that through the postpartum depression and the postpartum anxiety because I didn't ask for help. I was scared. I was terrified. Now I ask for help in any situation because at the end of the day, when people love you, they want to help you. But you can be independent and still get help. Like, it doesn't make you any less of a person or any less of a mom. In fact, I think I'm a better mom because I ask for help. Because Having a baby is not a piece of cake. <laughs> it's hard work. Yeah, the first baby. With Ralph, I would have people over to meet the baby, and I would have, like, breakfast made, and the house would be clean. You're insane. It doesn't make any sense, and I would be, like, looking up things to do on, like, Pinterest, and I wanted to, like, look good. <laughs> and, like, this baby, I wish this, I'm, this was a video, because I'm like, did I put my eyebrows on today? I don't think I did. Right. So I don't even look, I look like a lab rat. <laughs> and... <laughs> And people come over and like, take him, I'm gonna go sleep. And that just, it's so vulnerable. Like yeah. the first time I was like, no, I want everyone to think I'm like good at this. And now I'm like, well, I mean, I know that I'm like fairly decent at it, but also like, I will let you do my dishes. Yeah. I will let you do my dishes. Yeah, and, because and think I'm about I'm a person it. with dishes. Have you ever been good at something that you've never done just right away? Like, are you just like good at, the first time you drove a car, are you just good at it? No. I literally crashed the car into our garage. Precisely. So, so and you had yes, to, that was great. And you had to learn that, right? You had to go to driver's ed and you had to be taught those things. Yet, you have a baby and you're just expected to know it all and you're expected to do it all. And we wonder why women's mental health kind of slips away from them right after they have a baby. No, it's the expectations have to be lowered a little bit. And I don't mean like, hey, you got your baby not in a car seat. Woohoo. No, get your baby in a car seat. But for the love of God, understand that you don't have to be a Pinterest mom. You don't have to have all these crazy expectations for yourself. If your baby is happy, smiling, breathing, and eating, you're doing it right. Everything else, that comes secondary, you know? As long as you're good and your baby is good, that's what matters. Danielle and Danny Starr aren't who they used to be, but they're back to being one person, a person who's been changed by her experiences, who's used them to learn and to grow before postpartum depression and anxiety, I was super, super extroverted all the time, right? Now, Danny Starr has to be extroverted now. Like, that's just who she is. Um, but I'm extremely introverted in my real life now, which I never was. I was the same person all the time. And, I, and who I am, like, morally, character-wise, that never changes. I always, I always am true to that. I stay true to me. And whatever that means, it doesn't mean I just stay true to what people want Danny Starr to be. It means I stay true to who I am. And she is such a big part of who I am. But as I've gotten older, we've grown, we've changed. We're not hyper-focused on Hollywood. You know, we're not hyper-focused on fun little trending topics. That's great, those are awesome. And you know what, sometimes you just need to laugh. But you know, I'm out here doing things because I feel like we need to change the world and we have kids now and it's just, it's just different. And it opened her heart and her mind in ways that she never would have before and allowed her to connect with people and become an even more incredible version of herself. So I'm going back to school, getting my master's in clinical social work because, and I'm gonna work with moms, mental maternal health.
It's important when you're talking about things like this, when you're talking about mental illness, that you don't try to make it seem like there's a happy ending, like everything's wrapped up with a nice, neat bow. I mean, Danielle's happy, and this podcast is going to end, but it's not like her mental health has come to some neat sort of conclusion. This is a process for her. This is something that she still works at. So the darkness is like, um, let's say, like a line in the sand, right? And occasionally I run up pretty close to it. But I feel that now, whereas before the darkness used to sneak up on me like sucker punch. You know, it didn't didn't give me any warnings. It just hit. Now it kind of gives me warnings. You're exhausted. You're a little irritable. You're very anxious. Occasionally it hits me a little harder and I cross the line, in which case at least I'm aware still. Right. I know it. I'm not afraid of it. I know I can come out of it. I work with my therapist, my best friend. Um, the people around me, and I say it. I say, you guys, I'm slipping. Like, I need help. And then, you know, I always I always wind up back where I'm supposed to be. Is depression funny? Depression, I have found, is even funnier than I thought because I'm talking about it my own from a very specific place and I'm making audiences of strangers laugh about it, which means that more and more people are dealing with these feelings than want to admit. Something wrong with me, I got the sadness I can't shake now. Is there something I can't take now? It's the hilarious world of depression. I'm John Moe. The way the show works, I interview some of the top names in comedy, some of the funniest and most interesting people around, all of whom have dealt personally with clinical depression. We hear about their lives, what has or has not worked in fighting the disease, and we have a few laughs. That makes us feel more connected with our fellow humans, makes us feel more understood, and smashes away at the stupid stigma around mental illness in general. I'm not a doctor. There will be no medical advice given, but maybe we'll learn something from each other. And here's our guest for this episode. I'm Baron Vaughn, and I'm in Los Angeles, California. Did you get that name? My name's Baron Vaughn. I don't talk about it that much because it's fucking incredible. <laughs> I have a rhythmically perfect name. I have the kind of name that makes you think I'll show up if you say it three times into a mirror. That's the kind of name I have. But people are always like, Baron Vaughn, what? <laughs> because it's an incomplete rhythm. It's a, it's a rhythm that people recognize, but there's a missing piece to pretty much everyone. That's what my mom was thinking about, rhythm. She wasn't thinking about history. She was just thinking about musicality. And I always wanted my name to be something like so unmistakably black, you know, so there's a precedent before I get there. Because Baron Vaughn, you don't know that person's black. Like, if you saw that at the top of a job resume, it'd be like, oh my God, Baron Vaughn. Hey, everyone, uh, apparently the king of lollipops is on his way. Yeah. <laughs> I heard if you smell freshly showered, he'll give you a crisp $2 bill. <laughs> but I always wanted my name to be something like so black, like Jamal Malik Jenkins. Just so there's a precedent. Like, oh my God, Jamal Malik Jenkins. Uh, hey, everyone, uh, basketball's getting dunked at noon. And then I walk in and somehow bring up, you know, a comparison between Shakespeare and black playwright August Wilson, and they go, oh shit, I'm racist, I get it now. And then I'm changing the world one Subway sandwich shop at a time. That's from Baron Vaughn's 2016 album, Black Existential Crisis. Baron Vaughn is a stand-up comedian and actor. He's a regular on the Netflix series, Grace and Frankie. He's been on Girls, various Law and Orders laws in order and he's the voice of tom servo in the upcoming reboot of mystery science theater 3000 baron's story begins in a place not widely known for being a comedy hotspot. this is in a little town called tucumcari new mexico nor a uh, northeast new mexico a place um people have been through um <laughs> not necessarily lived in <laughs> but it is on Route 66, the very famous uh, American road, America's Main Street, they call it. 
uh, which was the actual main street of Tucumcari, New Mexico as well, uh, was Route 66. That's where Barron grew up. He was initially raised by his great-grandparents, and that's where comedy started. They um, were the people that I loved and the people I looked up to, and of course there were these TV shows that they would watch that made them laugh. Um, a handful of different sitcoms, you know, because at the end of the um, 70s, you know, early 80s, there was this um, glut of sitcoms that were featuring black people um, and telling stories like that, like, you know, like the Jeffersons or Good Times or Amen or 227. And so they watched those Sanford shows. Sanford and Son. Yes, exactly. Um, Sanford and Son, What's Happening. Give Me a Break, starring Nell Carter. Um, so they loved those shows and they were really funny to them and I would watch them. And then also they used to watch Nick at Night and um, doesn't exist anymore. Um, but Nickelodeon, I think it was after 5 or 6 p.m., stopped being cartoons and, and uh, TV shows for children and started being old black and white sitcoms from usually the 50s and 60s. And I would watch those as well. I'm talking stuff like Dobie Gillis. Uh, Patty Duke, um, Mr. Ed, uh, Make Room for Daddy, um, or stuff like that. And um, I watched a lot of that TV, but that the first time I saw Sammy Davis Jr. on Patty Duke, I had to react the exact same way that black people in the 60s reacted. When I was like, what? We're on TV! We made it! <laughs> um, and then, to, to accentuate those shows, I guess, they would also show the original five years of Saturday Night Live, um, SCTV, and Laugh-In, and The Carol Burnett Show. So I watched all of that stuff and was soaking it in and uh, observed the laughter from my, my parental figures. And I was like, oh, I can get them to do that based on, based on what I've seen, based on the research I've done with all these TV shows. Uh, I'm pretty sure I can recreate a situation in which they will laugh. Let me try. So that's kind of when I saw that I had some sort of power, I want to say, some power, some value, is that I could make them laugh um, as hard uh, as all the TV shows that they were watching and loved. Barron moved with his mom to Las Vegas when he was around eight, and he lived there with his mom, grandmother, and eventually a stepfather. It wasn't the most nurturing environment. I grew up um, in a family that was keeping a lot of different secrets and um, a lot of different fear and shame and stuff. People just weren't talking about things. And my mother, um, you know, God bless her heart, when I was in high school was an addict. So, um, you don't become an addict unless you have some sort of deep, deep pain that you are trying to um, medicate. Um, and so this is a person that was raising me. So the tools I had of understanding of, of dealing with people, um, you know, because your parents essentially, you know, just like you speak English, I speak English. Like when we were children, we didn't speak any language and we, we copied what we saw our parents do until um, they understood us. And it's the same for emotionality. So it's like all of our emotional languages came from our parents. So whatever they're blocked on, whatever they're stuck on, we have it as well. And that is something that takes a long time to become aware of to be able to work on. So I was not aware. I was completely unaware of those things, of those feelings. And, um, but, you know, being a child of an addict is, a, you know, a lot of times a surefire way to have some sort of anxiety or depression when you get older. Um, because I had those things, because I was, you know, internalizing things or trying to disconnect from certain things and would sit in this place of feeling like um, deserved punishment, I guess you could say, like, uh, things suck and I deserve it to be that way. Why did you um, deserve it? That's just a deep-seated shame or, you know, self-hatred or self-loathing, you know? Um, so I know now that that's not true. But, you know, when you're a child and you get treated, because you're, you're a, a child can't compartmentalize. You know, when you become an adult and someone treats you a certain way, you go, oh, that's their stuff. That's not, has nothing to do with me. But when you're a child, you don't know that, especially if it's someone you love. It's your mom, it's your dad, you know, it's just, it's a sibling. You go, well, 
I must deserve this in some way. Like I must have done something to um, to elicit this behavior. You know, not as articulately as that. You know, because uh, I probably was saying elicit when I was seven. <laughs> like, I must have done something to elicit this behavior. There's hmm. a preponderance of evidence that uh... yes, they have a propensity for aversion. <laughs> Here's Baron on his 2011 album, Raised by Cable. I grew up in a, in, a, in a neighborhood where people had knives and guns, and I speak like this. I'll just throw out the word perspicacity if I feel it. So my, my plan was like, if I'm funny, I won't get killed. And I'm here today because that worked. You know, because it was like, motherfucker, I will shoot you until you are stabbed. And then I would be like, why would you ever want to shoot me? Scoop, deep, deep, do, 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 do. Skeet, skeet, do, 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 do. You're right, the world needs clowns. I especially enjoy your elbows while scatting routine. Very cerebral. Makes me think maybe it's not you I'm angry at. Perhaps what I'm angry at is systematic institutional failure. But since that's more of an ideology rather than something with a face that I can blame, my anger pours out into everyone and everything around me, which today happens to be you. And I'm thinking maybe instead of shooting motherfuckers and putting them in the ground, I should make a documentary to remember those that I've lost. Baron says he was a nerdy kid who really wanted to be liked. So he was always doing funny voices and comedy bits, which sometimes works for kids and often doesn't. He didn't fit in with the kids in his neighborhood, and he was black, which added an additional layer of otherness. At home, there was pain, addiction, abuse. So life at home was predictable and dangerous. Life outside was unpredictable and dangerous. You know, when I was a kid, I... I apologized a lot. I said I'm sorry a lot. I, I, I hung my head in shame, um, possibly because I was being shamed a lot. So I just decided to stay in that place. Why were you being to, shamed? Um, because I existed. <laughs> you know, because I was around. This was shaming and, at home that you were getting? Yes. Yes. And, um, and that school as well, you know, again, like this is, uh, you know, there are, there are deeper, deeper implications because it, it, I kind of, I think a lot about how these, um, these huge issues, like the issue of racism, like the, you know, like they, how that becomes domesticized in that you have a giant group of people saying you, everyone who looks this way, you don't matter. You, how you look is wrong. How you talk is wrong. How you act is wrong. What you believe is wrong. And if you say that to a huge group of people, um, it doesn't just get dissipated over the group. Every single person internalizes it in some sort of way. And it becomes a thing that they have to deal with for the rest of their lives, whether they want to or not. So sure, at school I was being treated like I was, um, hyper or um, disruptive, you know, I think if, if uh, the word is precocious, the word is imaginative, but those things were being um, discouraged, you know, by some teachers. Um, of course, I think there are a lot of teachers who encouraged me, which is why I am who I am today, you know, decided to become a professional artist because I had teachers, you know, whose voices um, cut through the 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 chorus of saying no 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 don't listen to all those people you you actually have some gifts and you actually should explore your imagination and you should explore these things so just listen to me <laughs> trust me you're going to be okay and you should learn how to figure that out and so teachers like that who help me in my life you know are like i said like the reasons i am who i am but then having um the majority of people or at least perceiving the majority of people to be like we don't approve of you and then going home and then having my family be like i also don't approve of you um so i was just kind of like all right well let me just sit i've been i've been shamed you know and and you know that makes you hang your head it makes you you know your your chest cave in it makes you kind of hunch over in this body of you know you you know of tears if you will that doesn't necessarily mean that you're crying it just means that you that body is the place that you are most comfortable because it's the place that you're being sent to 
all the time. So I just started to accept that as a fact of my life. And let me just stay here. If, if everyone's going to put me here, let me just stay here so they don't have to. Um, and I would say, I'm sorry for things that weren't my fault. It just felt like I was always apologizing for things. He graduates from a performing arts high school in Vegas, goes to Boston University, and starts doing stand-up. Small part in a Broadway show soon after, and more stand-up. Enough stand-up and commercial acting work that he can quit his day job at a law firm, and then he's a professional performer, far away from the environment he grew up in, which gave Barron a chance to try to figure out what the hell happened in those early years. So did you feel like you weren't taken care of? as a kid like because that with addiction that often follows that the that the kid grows up feels like well no one else is taking care of me i gotta take care of myself and then the 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 walls go up and and it becomes a very lonely place how about this how about i conflated love and anger because that's what was happening for my mother what does that mean it means that because of what was happening to her she had a lot of anger and she had a lot of resentment But at the same time, I am her flesh and blood. I'm her son, so she loves me. But her love was always tinged with this resentment or anger of the situation we were in. So when she gave me affection, it had that stuff embedded in it. And so I, as a a straight man especially, because, you know, I become romantically involved with women. So when women have affection to me, I'm projecting my mother. I'm like, they must be angry at me in some way because they love me. Um, or if they're angry at me, it must mean that they care. So care and anger were the same thing. And so I wanted to be away from that. So I was scared of people caring about me. Yeah, because the anger was that, sure to follow. Exactly. And, it, and, I, and somehow I'm going to become a disappointment to them. I'm going to let them down in some sort of way. There's nothing I can do that's going to make them happy because... If they if they like me, they must be unhappy in some sort of way. So this is all the projection that I was doing. So, of course, it made me want to push people away. It made me not want to let people in too much because because all that fear and all that stuff. Wow. How long did that take you to unpack? Because that's that's some graduate level stuff <laughs> to, <laughs> to figure that out about your own brain. These are, these are things that like in the last couple of years, I really started to understand, you know, and I can... Uh, because of a lot of different work that I've done, like going to therapy, because going to therapy is 